members, the President. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should all live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society, bless this Legislative Council now assembled to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory, the honour of Her Majesty, and the continued benefit of the people of this state. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This house acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pays its respects to elders both past and present. Members, I have a statement. Uh, members, the clerk recently invited you to participate in our upcoming member education sem seminars. Next Tuesday evening during the dinner adjournment, the Parliamentary Council, Mr Jeff Lorne, and Deputy Parliamentary Council, Ms Yuna Cooper, will be providing an introduction to the Parliamentary Council's office and an introduction to legislation. They will be returning in the coming weeks to discuss the drafting of private members' bills. In late June, the Honourable John Cowdell, AM, former President of the Legislative Council, will be delivering a session with our Clerk Assistant House on how to ask an effective parliamentary question. These seminars are an opportunity for new members to develop their understanding of parliamentary processes and proceedings and provide a refresher for returning members. I encourage all those who are interested to attend. Are there any petitions? Are there any statements by member, ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Are there any papers for tabling? Leader of the House. Copy paper to be laid on the table. Reports. Main roads, traffic noise assessment, North Link, stage three, 2020. Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? Are there any motions without notice? Members, we now move on to motions on notice. Uh, and item one on our business program, um, Cyclone Saroja and recent bushfires. Uh, and the motion before us is that this house acknowledges the devastating impact that Cyclone Saroja and the recent bushfires have had on Western Australian communities and commends our emergency services for putting themselves in danger to protect Western Australians and to ensure the recovery of those communities. Uh, continue, Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I'm only half standing because she's not here. I will stand, but I will be ending the debate, so I'm just making sure there's nobody else that wants to speak. Case, Are there any other members wishing to contribute to this debate? Leader of the House. Thank you very much, um, President. Um, can I thank members uh, of the House who contributed to this debate and thank them um, for their support and the um, elements that they noted? Uh, about the impact uh, that the cyclone had uh, and indeed the recent bushfires uh, and the recognition that went to our emergency services uh, personnel as well and commend the motion to the House. Uh, does that go to a vote, Nigel? Yep. 
that's the reply. So the question is the motion. Uh, so the question is the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Members, we now move to item two. Standing Committee on Environment and Public Affairs Terms of Reference. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, on behalf of the dearly departed but not deceased Honourable Simon O'Brien, uh, who is no longer with us, uh, I'll take this opportunity to move uh, that with re reference to recommendation five of the final report of the Select Committee into Local Government, the terms of reference of the Standing Committee on Public on Environment and Public Affairs be amended as follows. One, to insert after term of reference 2.3a, a, matters relating to local government, and two, to renumber the paragraphs that follow accordingly. Uh, members, the uh, Leader of the Opposition has moved that motion. Madam, uh, President. I give Sorry. the call to the Leader of the Opposition. Sorry, President, I'll get used to that eventually. It's I'm sure ingrained, you will, Honourable but, Member. Um, I, I might take a few bits of reminding. Um, President, so this, this was a motion moved by the Honourable Simon O'Brien, who, who was an integral part, uh, and I think uh, has, has, was an integral part of the committee, the select committee that examined local government, uh, on, I think, originally, the motion of one of the other members who's no longer with us. Um, the Honourable Charles Smith, I think, was a part of that as well. Uh, and effectively, as we've heard from various speeches, and even in one of the, or the inaugural speeches of yesterday, we heard grave concerns about local government and its performance and its functions. Uh, and we could talk for some period of time about how local government does perform and where its shortcomings are. Uh, I simply make this observation, uh, having, uh, having seen the argument for a long period of time, and that is, uh, from my perspective, it is, not, it is not where the boundaries lie geographically that are the issues that local government need to address. Uh, it is the performance of functions and particularly uh, the limitations that might need to be placed on, on local government as directed by the state government and state parliament, which is its want, President, because obviously local government in this state in particular is an is a offshoot of the state. Uh, local government is empowered by the Local Government Act. It is a piece of state legislation. Now, we could debate that for some period of time, and it's not my intent to take a long period of time this morning. Uh, it was also the Honourable Simon O'Brien's, uh, and I, he does get to use the honorific post, post his uh, parliamentary career, so I can refer to him that way. Uh, the Honourable Simon O'Brien took a great interest in local government, having been a part of it for a period of time before his parliamentary service. And he was particularly interested in this part of the report uh, of the select committee, and that was to have a parliament of a, a committee of this parliament be given and granted the oversight of local government in this state. Now, I understand that it's not the universal opinion of everybody, and I suspect the government may not support uh, the intent of putting this into this particular committee. But I think, in, in, particularly on behalf of the Honourable Simon O'Brien, it is worth us discussing and looking at whether a committee of this parliament should have a specific recourse to examine local government. Now, if it did so, I wouldn't be surprised to see that much of its time was occupied in that matter. Uh, and having actually served in the 40th parliament uh, president on the um, Standing Committee of Envi Environment and Public Affairs, I can tell you that uh, the functions of local government were a not infrequent part of discussion and a not infrequent uh, topic of petition. And so it might be argued, my, my good friend, the, uh, the Honourable Matthew Swinburne, in chairing that committee uh, in the last parliament, would knows well uh, that repeated attempts were made to have the committee examine in detail the performance of local government. Uh, and the committee, with burden down, it was as it was generally with enormously weighty matters uh, in other directions, and by its uh, by its own set of functions. Uh, not generally able to examine the minutiae of some of the accusations that were made in those various treatments that we got. Uh, we didn't go into great detail on local government. Uh, the question before the House, honourable members, is therefore whether a committee, and if not this committee, feel free to contribute by suggesting an alternate committee. Uh, I'd rather that you didn't suggest ongoing 
select committees in every parliament, I think that's an immensely difficult process. You might like to contribute and say there is another way to do this thing. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the government will say that the Minister for Local Government has this fully under control. Um, I I'm not convinced that the previous Minister for Local Government had local government fully under control in Western Australia and functioning at peak efficiency. Um, I guess we need to give the new Minister for Local Government a little time uh, to establish their credentials. But it is absolutely the case that there are issues around local government that are worthy of further, further examination and not the specifics as, as the previous committee uh, was, was frequently asked to investigate you know, sort of levels of corruption and whether councillors were doing the right thing and uh, particularly if, if I didn't get the outcome in local government debate that I thought was most appropriate, uh, that there must be something corrupt in the system and the uh, uh, petitions were repeatedly put forward. I'm not suggesting that that be the role of this parliament. There are other avenues for that. But I'm more interested in the overall role of local government and in some areas uh, where they have authority. For example, across the South West, a number of local governments are now starting to form dam policies. So where, where they think dams would be appropriate and where, where how they manage water resources. Now we have a thing uh, called the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation whose job is to do exactly that. And when you have multiple levels of administration, you generally just add exponential levels of difficulties. And in this particular case, there's a lot of local governments that don't sit over top of an entire catchment. Um, it is a shared catchment and it is by far more appropriate than an authority that covers and in the entire state uh, look, at those, look at those details. So it is likely at some point that a committee that looks into the functioning of local government might seek to ensure that local government is dealing with those areas in which local government particularly should be focused. Uh, and I, for one, don't automatically say that local government should be restricted to roads, rates and rubbish. I know that's the opinion of uh, some members. Uh, and it is certainly a, an opinion that is professed out there in the uh, greater area. But there is a role for local government to be involved in many areas. Uh, there is a role for them to make sure that their citizens are well, well catered for. Uh, it is not necessarily universally the case that they should be involved in every area of life, however, and a better coordination with the state government, uh, I think, is absolutely essential. So I don't think there are any members in the chamber who would suggest that the performance of local government over the last, let's say, 30 years has been without blemish. Uh, having said that, of course, as local government frequently points out, uh, it's unusual to see local government who says that the performance of the state government and the state parliament has been blemish free as well. And that's a, that's a, a foible we need to accept. Uh, unfortunately for local government, the constitution, the constitution empowers uh, this body and this chamber and the government to oversee their work, and I think that is entirely appropriate. Uh, so, honourable members, th this is a question mark before the House about how this House, in particular, and this this chamber, uh, manages those concerns about local government. And it was the view of the honourable Simon O'Brien that a committee process dedicated to overseeing that function and being able to take evidence, as committees do, uh, and hear complaints, as committees do, and then make recommendations without having any authority to, to discipline or direct, which I think is also important, was a reasonable concept. It may not be the perfect solution. It may not be the, the way that you fix the issues that exist around local government, and somebody may come up with a far better one. Uh, but this is, the, this is what the committee recommended, uh, and for that reason, and on behalf of the Honourable Simon O'Brien, who was passionate about his advocacy of local government, I take pleasure in moving the motion to test the will of the House, as it will, as it were, to see whether the House considers that this is an appropriate solution to the numerous problems that exist. Uh, if I sat here, mm. President, and discussed all of the issues of local government, we would be here for some period of time. Uh, and I'm attempting, because we want to get to a number of other things, particularly inaugural speeches, not to do so. But I, I think this is a worthy motion, certainly a worthy motion for debate. Uh, and if you have a better solution for the examination by this chamber of local government, by all means, uh, proffer up an alternate opinion. Um, but in the meantime, I ask that members consider supporting the motion. Um, Leader of the House. To the House that the government won't be supporting the motion, but I do it in the nicest possible way uh, because I had a conversation with the Honourable Simon O'Brien 
um, before he um, finished his time in here. So he came to see me about this motion and he said that I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he anticipated that the government um, would not necessarily support the motion. But he also told me he had approached the Minister for Local Government. He had arranged a time to catch up um, with the Minister for Local Government um, to have a cup of tea, in um, the Honourable Simon O'Brien's words, um, and uh, to talk about these issues. Um, and he also indicated to me that in his conversation with the Minister for Local Government, he found it quite a constructive uh, conversation and the Minister for Local Government indicated to him that he was interested in what the Honourable Member had to say because he was going to speak at a Walga event um, in the not-too-distant future and he was going to use those comments um, in that debate. So um, I'm, I'm comfortable that the Honourable Simon O'Brien knows that the Government is not uh, going to support um, this motion, but I'm also comfortable that um, the Honourable Simon O'Brien has put in place measures um, with the Minister for Local Government to talk about um, the issues and to help inform the Minister for Local Government's um, consideration of these um, issues. So I actually thank the Honourable Simon O'Brien for, um, for moving the motion and then coming to speak to me um, in that way. Um, so if I can just um, put some comments on the record because uh, the committee, of course, um, the committee report has been considered um, by government. I want to um, thank uh, the committee uh, for their report, which contains some 36 um, recommendations. Um, the Honourable Simon O'Brien obviously was part of that, so was the Honourable Laurie Graham, the Honourable Martin Aldridge, uh, the Honourable Diane Evers and the Honourable Charles Smith, and I want to thank them for their work. Um, so we tabled the government response to that uh, in November uh, last year, and that response noted that while several recommendations are supported, many recommendations relate to amendments to the Local Government Act and the planned review of and development of a new Act. By way of background for honourable members, in 2017 we committed to reviewing the Local Government Act 1995, which included um, extensive consultation with local government, community members and special interest groups. And then based on that consultation, we introduced and passed the Local Government Legislation Amendment Act 2019, which provided a number of key reforms, including a mandatory training for council members, a revised gift framework, a mandatory code of conduct, standards for recruitment, performance and termination of chief executive officers, and increased access to information for the community. We also indicated that that was the first tranche and a second phase of uh, the Local Government Act review um, is underway and further reforms are currently being um, considered. And um, the Minister has authorised me to say that um, those reforms that are under consideration now are being informed by the Select Committee's um, report, along with the Local Government Act review panel report and the City of Perth inquiry um, report. Recommendation five of the Select Committee report related to the granting of a new or existing parliamentary um, committee, in this case an existing one, with powers to address the local government issues. Um, so we advised the House when we tabled the report, uh, the response to the report, that um, uh, we would not be accepting that uh, particular recommendation, that Parliament has charged the Minister and the Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries with oversight of local government um, through the Act. Um, that Local Government Act sets out the regulatory framework um, and ultimately the Minister for Local Government is responsible for the administration of the Act and of course the Minister reports to and is accountable um, to the Parliament and indeed then there are other um, agencies, oversight agencies including the Auditor General, Corruption and Crime Commission uh, and others to um, oversight um, various elements of the roles and functions of both the Department uh, and the Local Government um, sector. Um, so um, we will not be um, supporting this particular uh, motion to um, add to the um, terms of reference, if you like, um, of the existing um, committee uh, into environment uh, and public affairs. Um, but I do want to place on the record the government's appreciation for the commitment uh, by the Honourable Simon O'Brien to improving um, local government oversight. And uh, I'm pleased that he has engaged with um, the Minister and uh, that the Minister has committed to him that um, he will take account of, these, um, of the committee report recommendations when considering the for reforms um, of local government. So, uh, President, with those comments I'll indicate the government will not be um, supporting the motion, but I do thank 
uh, the Honourable Simon O'Brien and, in his absence, the Honourable Steve Thomas for bringing the motion before the House. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. I think the noes have it. Members, we move now to consideration of committee reports. You're done. Members, we uh, move to consideration of committee reports, and uh, there is one report before you, that is the Standing Committee on Procedure and Privileges, Report 61, Progress Report, Supreme Court Proceedings and Matters of Privilege Raised in the 40th Parliament. Uh, I give the call to uh, the Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, um, Deputy President. Um, so I move, I'm going to do, uh, perhaps by way of explanation I can do this for the House, because um, I'm sure for some new members this is clear as mud. Um, I'm about to move two motions. One, that the report be noted, which gets the report, the, the debate started. And secondly, then I'm going to um, move that um, consideration of it be adjourned to the next sitting of the House, um, so that it stays on the notice paper, but for the purposes of today, we'll then move into the debate on the COVID um, bill. Um, so, um, Deputy President, I move that the report be noted. Uh, thank you. A Leader of the House has moved that the report be noted. Leader of the House. Deputy President, I move that consideration of the report be adjourned to the next sitting of the House. Uh, members, the motion before you is that consideration of report number 61 um, be postponed to the next sitting. Be postponed to the next sitting of the House. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you. Can I thank the uh, Leader of the House uh, for the consideration of this? Obviously, uh, we have an agreement that we'll go to other business today. Um, I'm noting that uh, going forward, we need to work on an agreement on what will happen next, um, and that at this point, neither, neither, neither major party has come to an agreement on that point, so there'll be some discussions going forward on the next stages. But uh, the opposition is obviously here to help, uh, and if that assists the process for today, um, we're very pleased to do so. Constant. Always. Uh, Always. Thank, thank you, members. Members, keep calm. Uh, members, the uh, motion before the House is that consideration of report number 61 uh, be postponed. Uh, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Those against? That is carried. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Um, and that completes. And that completes consideration of committee reports no, no, uh, for yeah. today. So I will now report. To the House. Yeah. To the House. Yeah, report to the President. Yeah. I will now report to the President. Yeah. Here you go. President, I have to report that the Committee of the Whole uh, considered standing considered I'll start this again. President, I have to report that the Committee of the Whole uh, has considered Stand Committee on Procedure and Privilege of Report 61, Progress Report, Supreme Court Proceedings and Matters of Privilege Raised in the 40th Parliament, 
and has postponed consideration of the same and seeks to sit again. President. I move Leader the of the House. I move the report be adopted. Members, the question is the report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We now move to uh, orders of the day. Leader of the House. Thanks, President. Without notice that orders of the day numbers one to five be taken after order of the day number eight. Members, the question is that uh, the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Which brings us to... Leader of the House. Thank you very much. Um, I want to make a statement in respect to maximum time limits uh, in respect to the COVID-19 response legislation amendment, extension of expiring provisions bill 2021. President, I advise the House that the COVID-19 response legislation amendment, extension of expiring provisions bill 2021 is a COVID-19 related bill. Accordingly, I have consulted with the party leaders and can advise that the maximum time limits for each stage of the bill pursuant to the temporary order made uh, on the 25th of May 2021 are second reading stage 120 minutes, committee stage 180 minutes, third reading stage 30 minutes. Uh, Members, we now consider order of the day number seven, COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension, extension of expiring provisions bill 2021. Uh, the Honourable Peter Collier. I think he's Oh, sorry, the question is that yep. the bill be read yeah, a second, second time. time. Yep. The Honourable Peter Collier. Thank you, Madam President. Just as an interjection, is Marty? Yeah, but yeah, but is he coming? Or? He'll be back at because I've only been about five. I'll, I can talk underwater, but. <laughs> so, no, no, he's not. Go Sorry, Madam President. We're, we're, we're Thank you, to order, very, order, 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 order members. Nice of you to be concerned. President, sorry, very. Here. I just want um, to try and Honourable work out member, you might benefit. <laughs> honourable member, you might benefit from some knowledge from the president which includes that your proposed next speaker may not be available for another half an hour. You probably know more than me, President. Can I just tell you that this... This <laughs> is a fact, <laughs> honourable member. But all I know is I've got about five minutes, but um, as I I'm said, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit further. Look... Uh, uh, you could also, honourable member, yes, move President. that the debate be adjourned. I know, I, I'm all conscious of that, but I just want to know whether or not the lead speaker is coming, so whether or not I elongate my contribution or I condense it. OK. How's this? You start with your uh, contribution and then you might be able to um, request that you... Thank you, President. Your I think everyone's be continued at a absolutely later salivating in the prospect of Thank my contribution today. Thank you. I'm waiting today. with bated um, breath. <laughs> and as I said, I don't really have that much to say. I'm just speaking uh, on behalf of the Liberal Party as a, as a component of the valued um, as, as a component, uh, component of the Valued Alliance, and um, I'm not lead speaker. That will be uh, Noted, thank Ma you, and that's uh, also Martin noted Martin. on the clock. Yeah, thanks, uh, President. Uh, look, what we're doing here is basically just extending the emergency powers leg uh, uh, legislation until, as I, my understanding from the briefing, is the 4th of January. Uh, so another six months, but until the 4th of January. So we don't have a problem with that. We've been through this a couple of times before. So in essence, what it's dealing with is it does provide the state emergency coordinator with those additional powers. Under, first of all, the Emergency Management um, Amendment COVID-19 Act. And within that, um, that's a part, uh, section 72A of that Act. And it does refer to 218 powers. There are currently 18 in place, and they deal specifically with issues with regard to uh, the current state, potential state of emergency, such things as the contact register, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, uh, the border provisions, quarantine, and face covering. So all of the things that actually we've become used to. 
And I've got to say, if you think about the, um, the emergency powers that we have at the moment, you may say, well, you've got some out there that are saying it's over, why do we, why do we bother, etc. Well, it's not over. I just go back and have a look at Victoria. You know, you're sitting there yesterday, what they, they, it's rising, rising, rising by the day. I had a couple of friends went over to Victoria two weeks ago. Uh, they're in their late 70s. They went over to see their family, hadn't seen them for 18 months. Uh, now, as soon as that very first case broke out in Victoria, whenever it was Sunday or Monday, Monday, so Monday, they were due to come back at the end of this week. They got on a plane and came home. And I've got to say, I was looking forward to going over to Melbourne in the winter break to watch the Mighty Eagles, but I think I might watch them from my bedroom, of my, of my lounge, quite frankly, um, because that's what we're dealing with. The, 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 um, the, the pandemic is not over. Guys, all you have to do is watch the television every single night, have a look at India, have a look at uh, Japan, have a look at nations throughout the world, and you see it is not over. All you need is one or two cases to come through, and once again, we are potentially in lockdown, which we found ourselves in uh, just a month ago. So that's what the situation is at the moment. So it would say somewhat... <laughs> oh, good. OK. No, I'm just getting warmed up, mate. You can go home. Go and have a coffee. <laughs> Yeah, cheers. Um, anyway, um, so having said that, when we're talking about things like contact tracing, we're talking about things like face masks, etc. We've actually become got used to it. I even got used to having a face mask. Some would say it was an improvement, but they, um, what you've got is you've got a situation where if it does break out again, we've got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared, and so we, as an op uh, as an opposition have supported the government in its endeavours to keep Western Australians safe. As former leader of the opposition, um, we facilitated the passage of the original amendments and the original changes to the Act and the extension and now the further extension. Um, and I'll let uh, the Honourable uh, uh, Martin Aldridge comment further in a moment. Suffice to say, um, as I've said, if you do have those dietitians of doom, those poor cynical souls out there that say that we're taking away their civil liberties, etc. Uh, quite frankly, I'd rather be in Western Australia than I would be, be in most other places in the world. And that's why we're supporting this, uh, this extension. So as far as that is concerned, I will thank the min I'd like to thank the minister and the plethora of advisers that came and gave me, <laughs> me a almost a personal briefing. It was actually a personal briefing about a month ago. It was very, very, um, very enlightening. And um, the advisers from each of the departments uh, were very well learned right around their brief and made me feel much more comfortable. So thank you very much to all of the advisers for your briefing earlier in the month. And true to form, um, they did provide the information that I requested. So thank you very much for that. The issue that I was looking at in particular was regard to contact tracing and the Safe WA um, app, which I use fastidiously, but I've got to say a lot of Western Australians unfortunately don't. That's my only concern with regard to it's not a criticism, it's a concern. And just anecdotally, I challenge anyone in this chamber to go out and sit out the front of their, their restaurants or sit out the front of their uh, shopping centres, uh, not too long, when people start talking about you, but sit out the front and watch how many people use the Safe WA um, app and how many people actually um, log in. And you'll be really surprised. No, no, but a lot don't. Now, that's an issue. That is an issue. Yeah, a lot don't. Because that is a real issue for us. Because if we do get down to the point where we do have to do contact tracing, we need, do need to isolate a, an area, that's a problem. And I've got the proof to prove it. I've got the figures to prove it. Come straight from the departments, and I have great faith in them. Now I'll just explain. Let's have a look. At, I, I asked for the figures on the contact tracing and the, the, the scans right, over the last 12 months. Uh, the Safe app, uh, app statistics, as at 7:20am, uh, the 3rd of May 2021. Cumulative scans since, man, since they became mandatory. That's on the 5th of the 12th, 2000, uh, up to the 5th of 12th, 2020. 178,440,521 scans. That's a lot of scans. Right? But remember, that's multiple scans as well. That's not just individual scans, that's multiple scans. Total individual scans, 1,848,170. Total business registration, 74,398. I might add, 
however, that that does not include the statistical data not being kept on paper-based registers. And you, again, that's an issue where you have, particularly with a lot of the older people, you know, going to the coffee shops, the coffee shop in Warwick Grove. I stood there and watched that for about half an hour. I just stood there acted as if I was looking at the jean shop. But I tell you now, there is a lot of people that did not sign in to that coffee shop. So if there is an outbreak, and there was, the last one, the guy did go to one of the shops in Warwick, right? It makes it difficult then to isolate that particular case. Now, just members, just um, consider this, and this shows how you know how we have become, to a large degree, on what we become immune to it. It's almost like we're it's all over now in Western Australia. Everything's fine, and let's move on. Well, let's just have a look. In December, um, there were that is December last year. There were 12,613,594 scans. That's in December, right? 12 million. In January, 14,268,603. That you think that's a lot, but it's not. That's all Western Australia going around multiple times. If you go to five or six places in a day, you add that on the cumulative amount. That's that's not an amount. And you know why it's not a, not not a significant amount? Because listen to this figure. In February, when we had lockdown. We had a lockdown and people became clicked on and went, goodness, it, it's still here. We've got to do something about it. 56,454,488. Uh, so that has increased from 14 million in January to 56 million when we had the lockdown. So do you, you honestly think people were scanning in the month before? Of course they weren't. It's only when they got, they got a bolt across, it shot across the bow that they realised that we'd better start scanning again. Right? It is serious stuff. March dropped off again, 50,932,983. And then April, once again, we're in, uh, we're in terminal decline, 39,903,621. My point being there, everyone, members, is that when we become complacent, this is not being used. And I, for, for the benefit of hands out, I'm holding up my mobile phone with my WA, Safe WA app on. Right? Now, there are people that are fastidious with it. They'll go out there. At, pardon? <laughs> what, my phone? <laughs> well, just get rid of that text message. <laughs> uh, anyway, that, um, my point being is that yes, we were being we were being ruthlessly um, uh, efficient in February, but we had a lockdown there. We had a lockdown, and people got back to the got back to that notion that we actually have to tap in wherever we go. Because if we're going to have effective contact tracing, uh, we're going to localise a particular outbreak, that is one of the most effective means that we can use. So thank you very much to the advisers. That's compelling evidence and it's did not pretty much reflect what I thought was the case. But even now, I, I reckon if you went out there now and, and did figures again in May, and as we move further on, you'll find they'll start to decline again. Remember, in December, in December, there were just over 12 million scans. Just over 12 million. In February, when we had lockdown, 56 and a half million. So that's it's not the gospel according to Pete. These are facts. These are facts. So, having said that, as I said, that is one of the vehicles that the government, that the authorities, that all of every group every uh, particular facet of government and public sector that is helping to keep us safe. They need that information. Information is power. If you don't have it, well, um, quite frankly, it makes it much, much more difficult to contain this, um, contain this um, a, a further, any further outbreaks. So, um, having said that, um, the the powers also extend, as I've said, to border provisions and, as I've said, when you're looking at instances where you have an outbreak in one jurisdiction and, um, you don't, and uh, Western Australia may be, may be impacted upon, of course, the logical uh, default position then again is once again to ensure that we are safe. And the best way to do that is to, as we've said, close the borders, as the government has done. And that's why Western Australians do. We feel we've always been a bit secessionist in Western Australia. We like we like our own company, but it's even more so when perhaps outside the boundaries or the borders, um, you've got a situation where perhaps life isn't quite as uh, quite as rosy as it is in uh, in the 
magnificent state of Western Australia, also with quarantine and the face covering. As I said, we held off and held off and held off. We thought we wouldn't, wouldn't need face covering in Western Australia. Finally, we realised that, in fact, not only do we need it, we actually can get used to it. And we think that just a little itsy-bitsy, that's one little sacrifice that perhaps we don't really need to worry about. That if that's the worst that can happen to us, we have to wear a face mask. When you have a look at what's happening, as I said, in a lot of other jurisdictions globally, you can understand that's a small price to pay. Finally, um, just with regard to the um, changes to the criminal code, uh, it is for uh, serious assaults and threats against public officers. Totally agree with that. On assaults um, that, that increase the penalties from seven to 10 years and increased uh, the penalty for threats from three to seven years. I asked with regard to the offences. Now, this was when I had the briefing, and I haven't got an exact date, so it may have changed from this that advisers may... Uh, I, I wouldn't imagine it's been much. But uh, there are 19 people have been charged on 28 offences. And if you ask what might those offences be, which I did, um, they're for those um, very, dare I say, attractive individuals that spit and cough on public offices, right, as a threat. So, you know, I mean, you can't imagine that people would do it, they do it. Right? And so 19 people, in fact, have been charged on 28 offences. You can't imagine anyone would do it, but they do do it. Right? So for officers and public officers, ambulance drivers and nurses, police officers and the like, they should be able to go to work and not have to suffer the possibility of being threatened about being spat on by someone that potentially might have COVID. I mean, you cannot comprehend that anyone would do it, but unfortunately they do. So all that's doing is it ensures that it extends, that, um, extends the penalties for that period of the time frame up until the 4th of January. So it's an extension of the emergency provisions that were allocated to the government or, or provided for in the government with regard to this bill. Uh, we think it's appropriate. We think it's uh, not unreasonable to extend it for six months. And for that reason, the Liberal Party, as a part of the Alliance, will be supporting uh, the bill. Members, we are currently debating the COVID-19 response legislation uh, extension of expiry provisions bill. President. Uh, before I give the call to the honourable member, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge Kerry Baptist College from Harrisdale and thank you for visiting the Legislative Council. I give the call to the Honourable Martin Aldridge. Uh, thank you, President. Um, and uh, uh, I thank uh, the Honourable Peter Collier for filling in in my, in my absence and kicking off the uh, uh, debate on this very important bill, being the COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill 2021, possibly the longest bill title I've had to read um, to date, President. Um, the I'd also like to thank the Leader of the House and the Government for delaying um, the commencement of the debate last evening when I was um, prevented from uh, being in the chamber uh, on uh, uh, dealing with some family matters, and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, to the bill today. Um, this bill uh, shouldn't be a stranger uh, to most of us who served in the last parliament. Um, I think this is the third occasion that the House has considered um, matters uh, relating uh, to this bill, which in effect is quite a simple bill and, uh, and extends, extends some previously passed and considered provisions um, uh, dating back to April of 2020 uh, it, with respect to the Emergency Management Act and the Criminal Code, which I'll go into in a little bit more um, detail shortly. Um, as members will recall at that time, um, uh, the state was in the uh, throes of considering a, a response and responding uh, to the growing pandemic uh, internationally and, and also within, uh, within Australia and within our jurisdiction. And, uh, and at that time, it was, it was obvious uh, that there were aspects of a number of acts, not just um, the Emergency Management Act, that were deficient in, in supporting the capacity and capability of, of governments to respond. And the issue uh, that arose out of the Emergency Management Act and the amendments uh, that were made previously to create new Section 72 capital A uh, of the Emergency Management Act of 2005, um, in effect, gives um, a person the ability to direct a, uh, a group of persons and, and also, uh, uh, also in respect to a class of, class of 
places uh, or persons, I think. I'll, I'll get to the right language a little later on. But it was, um, um, it was a power that didn't exist previously um, in the Emergency Management Act and obviously is, is quite important in the way in which directions have been issued. And quite a number of directions have been issued, uh, President, and, uh, and that was one of the questions that I asked about um, with respect to uh, how many directions rely on these 72 capital A powers, and, and, I'll, and I'll go to that shortly. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the quite prompt briefing that I had um, from the government and its advisers on this bill. Like the Honourable Peter Collier, I think I was in the largest meeting room in Parliament, and um, I turned up and we were like sardines, and I was a bit worried that uh, we might be breaching some sort of social distancing direction or something, but there were about 10 police officers in the room, and I thought if I was going down, they were going with me. So. Um, um, I was reminded that Parliament's a workplace and is exempt from those types of, uh, types of arrangements. But the, the, there were a number of agencies uh, present, uh, including DFS, um, WA Police and the Department of the Attorney General, uh, potentially others, who were very helpful, uh, both during the briefing and in the uh, follow-up information um, that I requested. Um, so, President, this, this issue uh, arose, as I said, in, in April 2020, when amendments were passed by both houses uh, in the early throes of, uh, of the pandemic period and, uh, and the initiation of the state of emergency uh, in Western Australia. Members will recall in November of 2020, a, uh, a further extension of 12 months was sought uh, from the government at that point. However, six months was supported following an amendment uh, by the Honourable Colin de Grasse uh, in this place prior to the last election, which would mean those provisions expire uh, on the 4th of, uh, 4th of July of this year, and now results in this bill where a further extension uh, of six months is sought. Um, the COVID-19 um, response bill um, will amend the emergency management amendment COVID-19 response act of 2020. The bill um, for an act that we created in April of last year um, to extend the sunset date that applies to Section 72 capital A of the Emergency Management Act um, so that those powers that have been created will be available for a further period of six months. Um, it's a little unusual, um, and I want to talk about the drafting of, of this bill uh, a little later, and I do, although I didn't have carriage of these bills in, uh, in April or November of last year, uh, I recall some of the debate, and there was some conversation about the way in which um, uh, Parliamentary Council has adopted a, a particular style of drafting these types of COVID response bills, um, um, for want of a better word, so that they implode after the, uh, the, the time um, um, or their usefulness um, comes to an end. And, and so this isn't actually an amendment to the Emergency Management Act, it's an amendment to um, the Act uh, which I just... Um, uh, which I just mentioned uh, a moment ago, being the uh, 2020 Act. Um, Section 72 capital A provides a catch-all power that enables a hazard management officer or authorised officer to effectively manage the response to an emergency and includes the ability to direct a person or class of persons to take any action that the officer considers reasonably necessary to prevent, control or abate risks associated with the emergency. Now, as I understand it, the issue that we had under the existing powers uh, in the Emergency Management Act, and I think it was a, um, a ladder section um, of the Emergency Management Act, perhaps uh, section 78. Um, no, that's the compensation provision. Section 75, the general powers during a state of emergency. Um, the issue that existed was there was an inability to direct, uh, to direct a class of people um, and yep, yeah, 75. Yeah, um, there was an inability to direct a class of persons to take an action um, during a state of emergency, and obviously that presents some um, some real issues in terms of responding to a pandemic, which obviously is the first time the Emergency Management Act has been deployed for that purpose. You can imagine a plane arriving this afternoon um, from another country, the requirement to issue a direction. Um, on the passengers disembarking from that plane or a ship or a, or a train from interstate or, um, or a whole range of other, other circumstances. Um, there was an ability to direct each individual 
Um, but you could imagine the practical challenges of doing that and the many, probably hundreds of thousands of directions that would need to have been issued uh, under those existing powers in order to achieve that. So um, it was clear uh, that there was a problem, and that problem was um, um, quite quickly remedied through this 72 capital A provision. Um, I think uh, while these provisions do have sunset clauses, um, there probably is <clears throat> going to need some consideration down the track about uh, some type of statutory review of the Emergency Management Act. I'm not sure if uh, the Act even has a provision uh, or one is scheduled. Um, but it is something that ought to be, I think, uh, considered in light of uh, this pandemic and the nature of it and, and the potential for future, for future pandemics. And, uh, and the Emergency Management Act isn't one of the pieces of legislation that forms part of um, the Emergency Service Act um, Acts review, and, and which is a project dating back quite some years now relating to the Fire and Emergency Services Act, the Bushfires Act, and other similar types of legislation with a view to combining them in one modern act. I believe this is an act that sits outside that project. So it probably is quite timely um, that some thought be given to uh, the EM Act and, uh, and its ability to provide uh, the appropriate powers and resources uh, to government in the long term. Uh, there are also amendments made uh, to the criminal code, <clears throat> which fall out of my um, direct responsibility as the uh, Shadow Minister for Emergency Services, but I will, I will touch on them um, um, briefly, President. So members uh, who were here in the last parliament will remember that there were amendments made to section 318 and section 338 capital B uh, of the code. 318 of the code deals with assaults on categories of people, um, most commonly public officers as defined by the criminal code, but also other persons undertaking, uh, undertaking public uh, functions. So assaults on those categories of people, including but not limited to public officers. Um, section 338B of the code uh, deals with threats uh, and, and, uh, and the amendment included uh, a higher penalty, which is a maximum of seven years imprisonment. So uh, this bill will deal with an extension of six months to those higher penalty provisions. Um, that relate to section 318 and 338 capital B uh, of the code. So clause four, four and five of the bill um, will simply delete a reference in the existing 2020 Act um, to 15 months and will insert 21 months with a cessation date of 4 January 2022. Now, um, in my briefing, I raised, I raised this issue, uh, President, in that um, the date um, is probably a rather arbitrary one. I mean, six months from um, 4th of July is the 4th of January. And, uh, but um, it's not common uh, for the parliament to be in session on the 4th of January, although um, the 4th of January 2022 will be, the parliament will be able to be recalled, obviously prior to that date if it's in recess. Whereas I think the problem that we faced um, last January was that the parliament had been probed. And so the ability to recall the parliament um, uh, well, there was still an ability to recall the parliament, but it was a little bit more complex um, than would ordinarily have been the case. Um, it's probably just an arbitrary decision to, to add six months and, and create the 4th of January, but, I, but I, what I'd like to um, perhaps get a greater understanding of from the government is, is um, I assume it would be their intention to, prior to the end of this year, consider the need for the um, uh, for the extension of these powers in the criminal, uh, uh, or the powers in the Emergency Management Act and the increased penalties in the criminal code, with a view to making sure that they are extended, if, if appropriate, uh, prior to that date of 4th of January 2020. Because one of the questions I had is why wouldn't you have um, made it either a little earlier or a little later um, when it was probably more likely for, for Parliament um, to be able to, to respond to that at, 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 the, at the time? Um, I want to turn now to um, some of the advice that I received supplementary uh, to my briefing. And, um, and one of the issues that I asked at my briefing, well, there were, there were several, but, but the first one was around how often um, Section 318 and 3 
38 capital B of the Criminal Code had been used, and in particular used with respect to the um, increased penalties. And, and it was a question that I actually asked the Attorney General via, uh, I, I think it was a question on notice last year, and, uh, and I don't have the response um, with me, but the response was effectively um, um, his department doesn't track um, offences and convictions uh, with respect to particular offences, and that information wasn't able to be um, wasn't able to be provided to me. But um, where there's a will, there's a way, President. And uh, and and thankfully, from the um, uh, from the briefing, I was able to get some information on on how these offences had been, uh, how many offences. Uh, had been charged and convicted, and, and, there, and this is probably a bit of a slight update on the figures that the Honourable Peter Collier just mentioned, because I think there was some refinement um, of these figures post the briefing uh, that we received. So uh, I just wanted to um, um, read some information that's been provided to me. The West Australia Police Force advised the WA Police Force prosecution application does not specifically identify offences against 3181A of the Criminal Code as distinct from other offences under Section 318. A manual keyword search of related cases from 4 April 2020 to 3 April 2021 was undertaken, which identified that 16 persons were charged with 24 offences of assault public officer, COVID-19 related, under Section 318 of the Criminal Code. No persons were charged with threats under Section 338 capital B2 of the Criminal Code. Assaults were largely committed against police, but have also included assaults against nurses and medical staff, transperth personnel and custodial officers. Seven accused have pending court appearances. Penalties have varied dependent upon the nature of the offending and include 12 months imprisonment, eight month conditional suspended imprisonment order suspended for 12 months, seven months imprisonment suspended for 12 months, um, six months and one day imprisonment, um, five months imprisonment, three months imprisonment, two months imprisonment, $2,000 fine, $1,500 fine, $300 fine in order to pay $800 compensation and $300 fine. And that was obviously an amendment, uh, I think, to the numbers uh, that were quoted in our briefing. And I think that the Honourable Peter Collier just mentioned in that three persons and four offences have been removed uh, from the information provided uh, because those offences occurred during the pandemic involving uh, although occurring during the pandemic and involving threatening COVID at the time of the assault, were prior to the increased penalty provisions applying. Um, so they were, I assume, charged under the, um, the pre-existing provisions of the, um, of the Criminal Code, which didn't um, come with the higher COVID-19 related uh, penalties. Um, so that was quite useful information um, that, was, that was provided. Um, interesting that, that all of the charges um, relate to the 318 assault um, or the serious assault provisions of the Criminal Code, code and, and, and um, there were no charges um, under the uh, threat, the 338 capital B provisions. Because I, I naturally thought you might have had a combination of both or you actually may have had um, potentially more threats than assaults. Um, but that isn't what's borne out in the, uh, in the evidence. Um, that I have. Um, one of the other questions I asked President was in relation to who are the authorised officers and hazard management officers, because what we're doing is we are granting these 72 capital A powers to those um, groups of people. And, uh, and the information that I've got is that the authorised officers um, are the Federal Police, Border Force, um, WA Police, and for the purposes of checking compliance with paragraphs four to seven of the contact register directions, a person employed or engaged in the Department of Fire and Emergency Services with a designation of station officer or above, a person designated as an authorised officer under section 24 of the Public Health Act of 2016, a person designated by a local government as an authorised officer under the section 24 of the Public Health Act 2016 for the purpose of the Food Act 2008, uh, for the purpose of facilitating enforcing compliance with the direction to remain in an allocated room at a quarantine centre, a security officer, and for specified uh, directions, i.e. crew, worker, border, transport, freight, transit, aircraft, a border officer. Um, and I was advised that no hazard management officers were appointed. The authorisation of HMOs in section 55 of the EM Act only applies during an emergency situation declared by a HMA. 
So um, um, that that answered uh, um, the, the the people who have been um, who who are able to exercise powers um, under the directions that have been uh, issued under 72 Capital A uh, of uh, of the Act that we are amending and extending those provisions for a further six months to for January 2022. Uh, my third question, President, was with respect to. Um, what would happen if this extension wasn't given um, and the 4 July 2022 date um, came along? And, uh, and so it was obviously, it was quite a body of work, I suspect, um, that somebody's done here, and I, and I thank them for doing it. Um, but I'm advised that there are, have been uh, a total number of 223 directions um, that have been issued um, that rely either fully or partially on Section 72 capital A, uh, and 52 of those 223 remain in force. And, and a number of those, um, I think, as the Honourable Peter Collier was talking about, relate to the ability to uh, gather information and, and deploy the uh, Safe WA app and contact registry with respect to... Um, uh, to those directions, and and so there's a, a very long, a very long list of um, of directions here, President. I'm not going to read out all uh, 223 of them in this in this time limited debate, but there are there are quite um, there are quite a number uh, that would not be able to exist in their current form, or potentially not be able to exist at all um, if section, if this extension wasn't um, um, amended beyond the 4th of July uh, 2022. And I, and, and I think there probably wouldn't be anybody who would disagree that that would present some very, diff some very significant challenges uh, for the way in which the state responds uh, during the pandemic. And, and obviously um, th there's times, uh, on that note, there's times when we, we get a little bit more comfortable and a little bit more complacent and we feel like the end might be coming near, and then something happens. And, uh, and it might be India, it might be Victoria, um, and we, we're seeing what's happening uh, in Victoria with the, uh, with the number of cases in, in the last few days, and, and our sympathies and our thoughts are with uh, our fellow Victorians and, and that state as it responds to, to that changing situation. Um, President, just before I move off directions, um, it's probably not strictly related to the bill, but I think one of the frustrations I'd like to express is the way in which we publish directions. Um, I mean, whoever, whoever in government decided that we would have one government website with everything on it, or to have a direction issued against them to leave Western Australia. Um, and uh, it, it is really difficult. Um, I think the whole project was designed to make government more accessible to West Australians and, and others. And this whole WA Gov AU streamlined single website has, well, personally I find it quite challenging, not, not easier. And maybe that's a transitional thing, maybe that will become um, different over time as we become more used to it, but actually finding... I challenge anyone to jump on the website and, and, and go, go now and try and find a list of the current directions in force those that have, and those that have been rescinded. It's not, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to do. It was, it was in the early um, months of the pandemic, but I think um, as we've now had the directions have gone into the um, hundreds, um, it's very difficult to actually access um, those legal directions. And remember, they are legal directions. They, you know, if you, if you um, offend these directions, you can face very significant penalties um, and indeed imprisonment. And, uh, and so uh, I think it is important that information as, as, uh, as vital as these directions are readily and easily accessible. I've found on a number of occasions when I've been trying to deal with a, with a constituent inquiry, uh, it, might be, it might be something in retrospect dealing with, well, what was the direction that was in place during that lockdown or the direction that was put in place during that lockdown which has now been amended, what was the one before it or the one or the two before it? It's, 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 it's difficult, and so um, 
if somebody, uh, I'm happy for somebody to correct me and say it's far more easier than, than, I'm, um, than I'm saying it is, and they can come and give me a, um, a crash course on the government's website. Um, but, uh, but I think that is something that perhaps government could, could uh, take on notice, with, at least initially with respect to the COVID-19 information um, and the directions, but also a, a broader whole of government um, approach, which is shifting to this WA Gov um, single website. Um, President, the just check that I didn't have anything else. Um, I did have some further information with respect to um, um, prosecutions or infringements um, issued. Uh, under the under the directions, but I, I'm not going to go through um, all of those um, in the interest of time. But I but I thank the uh, um, but I thank the briefers for the information that they provided, supplementary to my briefing, and uh, and it's interesting because I recall one of the early things that we did in the Emergency Management Act amendments was actually to create. A, uh, for want of a better expression, an on-the-spot fine. I think our, our EM Act in its previous form um, had quite significant penalties, and one of the things that we were it was deficient was the ability, uh, the ability to provide a, um, a you know, $1,000 uh, on-the-spot fine or a smaller fine, um, which we're now seeing um, in some of the directions that are issued, because obviously some of the... Um, um, you could, you're going to need a, a range of infringements um, and, and penalty options to deal with a scale of circumstances. And, and so obviously um, infringing somebody for not wearing a face mask when they should be or not scanning um, their QR code when they should be is probably quite different to somebody evading a police um, checkpoint um, or, 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 some, or some other action. Um, now, I did want to talk about the, the drafting. Um, I did want to talk about the drafting, and, and, and we've seen, um, um, I, I, it's probably more just curiosity more than anything, um, um, Leader of the House, in, in the, way that we, the way that this bill has been um, drafted, which is, is that, well, sorry, I should say, not this bill, the original bill in, in, in April of um, 2020 that we passed. Um, um, the bill was drafted in a way, in, in a way that uh, that had the, and I actually think it was the Honourable Stephen Dawson who had carriage of it um, in this place um, at the time. So yeah, we'll, we'll blame him. No, no, it's, it's not a blame. I, I, just, I just think it's it's interesting. So we we had um, the Emergency Management Amendment COVID-19 Response Act of 2020, and that's the act that we passed in April, and that's the act that we're amending. Um, I think some people are um, are a little confused in thinking that we're amending the Emergency Management Act. We are not. We're amending this act, which amends the Emergency Management Act, um, which, which I do find um, a little peculiar. And, 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 I, and I know when I had, um, uh, just listening to the debate on the two previous occasions, um, and it might have even been attending one of the other uh, briefings when we dealt with this matter, um, it... Member, uh, continue, please. OK, no worries. Um, I, uh, the commencement um, clause of that Act, Clause 2, um, actually uh, deals with... Uh, no, sorry, that's not right. That, that deals with the um, retrospectivity. It's, it's uh, Clause 10 of that Act that deals with it, uh, uh, the repeal of the 72 capital A that is inserted into the Emergency Man in Management Act. And, and I'm told, well, if my recollection serves me well, I'm told this is a neater way of, of creating these types of temporary legislative provisions, because when it reaches that point in time, they disappear from the Emergency Management Act of 2005. They are automatically repealed by the expiration of time. Now, um, there's no such provision that repeals the Emergency Management Amendment COVID-19 Response Act of 2020, and I assume that will continue on 
um, in, in, in perpetuity because that act, that act did a range, um, a range of other things um, which were deemed appropriate um, at that time, which didn't have those sunset clauses um, and that were intended, uh, that were intended to continue um, uh, beyond. And, and, uh, and just flicking through, um, uh, just flicking through this, there were, you know, things like the electronic monitoring of persons um, in in quarantine, um, for example, and uh, that isn't that isn't a provision uh, that uh, is repealed with the expiration of time. So this act, um, I assume, will continue, and 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 its amendments will will um, still appear in the Compilation Act of the Emergency Management Act 2005, and um, but I guess it's a. Uh, uh, a crafty, perhaps, way of of, um, of of repealing those provisions, or a cleaner way, perhaps, of, of repealing those provisions once they are no longer con considered. Noting, noting my earlier comments, um, that there, it may be appropriate that these that the Emergency Management Act be considered as a whole uh, earlier rather than later, uh, to make sure that it remains fit for purpose for a state response into the future. Um, let me just go back to... Compensation. No, that's not what I want. Now, um, President, I didn't bring um, with me uh, Today, the um, I understand there was a media statement issued today with respect to the uh, uh, the compensation arrangements that have been put in place. I know this was an, an issue that featured in the uh, in the other place in the debate, which is um, after that last ANZAC Day lockdown, um, there was a call, particularly from the small business community, that I think had had. Uh, had had you know the impact of the earlier lockdown in 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 late January, then the Anzac Day lockdown, and then and uh, and we're starting to have we're feeling the effect of 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 those sorts of business disrupt disruptions in in short succession. And there was a call um, shortly after for government to respond in in some way to support um, parts of the business community uh, and the community more generally that had been affected by by these disruptions. And and, and I recall. Um, media at the time from, I think it was probably the small business minister and, and, and the premier uh, that were saying, you know, doing this is, is, is too difficult. It's um, where do you start and where do you stop? It's, it's, it's just not possible. And, and um, interestingly, it was possible when it was announced on the, uh, on the 6th of May uh, that some, the small business relief uh, was on its way with a targeted program. Uh, a day after, uh, a day after, President, this bill was announced by a media statement on Wednesday the 5th of May um, that the government was introducing a bill to extend the time, pr time frame for these COVID-19 measures. And the media statement that I don't have um, with me today because of the rapid progress um, that the Legislative Council is making on, uh, on, its, uh, on its business program today is I think that that program has actually opened, uh, has opened for applications. Um, if I can go back to... to uh, the concern around compensation, which is how how um, uh, how do we, and particularly now the government's acknowledged that there does need to be um, some type of response. How do we structure a compensation regime, either within or external to um, the Emergency Management Act, to assist those who are directly affected by directions that are issued? And obviously, um, there are provisions in the Emergency Management Act. Um, they commence uh, at part seven uh, of the Emergency Management Act of 2005 um, that relate to compensation, but they are limited. They are limited to the application of certain powers within the EM Act, and they largely relate on my um, review of the relevant sections to, to the exercise of powers um, where property is lost or damaged. Um, which is distinct from, I guess, the circumstance that um, 
that we've been talking, and not, when I say we, I mean the West Australian community has been discussing over the last few months, which is the, the, the COVID-19 impact on, on community events, um, on businesses, on, on certain sectors. And, uh, and so that is something that um, um, I know um, there was some debate on uh, in the assembly and, and it would be, I think, welcome and supported uh, um, by others um, if the government were to take a, a more long-term view um, to when this happens next time. Because certainly now the government's accepted through the opening of its grants program um, today, which offers $2,000 grants for Perth and Peel small businesses impacted by the Anzac Day long weekend lockdown, um, certainly accepted the need for some support. And so I think the question that follows is, um, what will the government do next time? Um, will it be simply a decision um, of the executive um, to develop a grants program uh, as it exists um, in this form announced on the 6th of May? Or will it be, or could it be a function of the Emergency Management Act when, when there is uh, uh, some sort of business loss or some sort of, um, or even a community loss, um, doesn't necessarily need to be a business that's impacted um, from, the, from the use of, of uh, directions uh, under, the, under the Emergency Management Act provisions. And, and, and I think in part, in part, President, we all expect, um, we all expect that when directions are issued, they're issued in good faith. Um, they're issued often uh, very quickly, times often against, um, uh, against the, uh, the state emergency coordinator and, and, um, and the excellent public servants that we have working in, in, uh, in and aiding the, the government's response to the pandemic. And, but there are times when unintended consequences do occur. And, and I don't want to go through a laundry list of of, of directions where that's been the case, but it's, it, it's, it's common knowledge, I think, to every member in this place that there have been directions that have had to be fixed. There have been directions that have, have had to be amended. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that's after an impact, um, an impact has, already been, uh, has already occurred on a business or on a person. The problem is identified and it does take some hours, sometimes even days, um, to rectify uh, to rectify that problem. And, uh, and, uh, and perhaps I think that's a debate for another time. As I said, I'm not going to go through um, a number of the issues that have been, that have related to the directions because, because I must say that when, um, when those issues have been identified, and often they're identified by um, members of parliament, uh, I must say the government and, and particularly the, um, the state emergency coordinator has responded to, to those issues. Um, so, in, in the broader context of what does a, um, uh, a more permanent compensatory re regime look like, I think it probably needs to be something that is a little bit more considered than, than simply providing grants after the effect. And so maybe we need to look at um, how the state, um, or, or maybe even it's a conversation br broader than the state, um, how we might consider uh, uh, the, the future of that issue, particularly in the, in, in the context of, of you know, none of us knowing when this pandemic or is going to end or when a future pandemic um, might occur. Um, I'll just go back to my notes and make sure that they were the main criminal code. Mm. Um, President, I think they were the main issues. Um, as I said, um, as I said in my in my earlier remarks, this is this is the third time most of us have dealt with the um, um, the content of uh, of this matter. Um, the matter's very confined in that we're we're discussing literally the expiration date of of relevant provisions in the EM Act and the Criminal Code. And, uh, and, and so I think um, many of the earlier issues that were um, considered have been covered in great more detail 
in particularly that April, uh, that April sitting when we were dealing with the initial response, uh, but also in prosecuting the argument for the length of period in November for when that ought to, um, uh, for when that ought to occur. Do you want me to keep talking? No? Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, President, with those few remarks, um, I, I reiterate that the, uh, the bill has, um, has, has the support of the, uh, of the opposition and, um, and I look forward to the Minister's response. Uh, members, the question is the bill be read a second time. I give the call to the Leader of the House. Can I thank members for their contribution um, to the debate? Um, so I thank the Honourable Peter Collier for stepping um, into the breach. Um, and uh, he did raise the important question of um, contact registers and making sure that uh, we remind people, and it's a good opportunity to do that, um, that the Safe WA app is really, really important um, and that everybody needs to be reminded uh, that they need um, to use it. Um, the continuation of the 72A powers are an important part of ensuring the contact registers continue to be available. Um, and uh, the member did uh, identify a decline um, in the use of the um, app. Oh, I need a Thank you very much. Um, in a decline and then a, a peak um, at that point uh, where we had the, um, uh, the lockdown to remind people. Um, the Honourable um, Peter Collier, I think, in that context was referring to um, whether there'd been an update on how many people are using um, the uh, app. Uh, there are other factors, including um, lockdown and restrictions, which may impact the number of scans. Um, we're continuing as a government to encourage people to scan in and to communicate to the broader community the importance of this. You can't cross the floor. I need a whip or somebody. Shelley. Go. Shelley. Can you just grab the... Thank you. Um, to communicate to the broader community the importance of this. Um, I thank uh, the Honourable Martin Aldridge for um, his uh, contribution um, as well. Um, and um, some of the issues that he raised, that it might be appropriate to consider the Emergency uh, Management Act um, as a whole um, to ensure that it uh, remains um, responsive. Um, the effectiveness of the emergency management framework in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic hazard is continually considered through the mechanisms available under the Mer Emergency Management Act of 2005. For example, uh, the State Disaster Council, uh, which I'm a member of, was deployed, which was deployed when the state um, of emergency was declared. Uh, the Emergency Management Act of 2005 also establishes various committees and decision-making structures at a local district and state level with appropriate cross-agency representation. Through these structures and at the agency level, observations and insights have been captured regarding the response to COVID-19 um, and where it's um, appropriate significant issues are escalated for immediate attention and action. It is anticipated that that will be a kind of continuous um, improvement process, if you like, a number of um, things that we're learning from the emergency management response to COVID-19 and any proposal to change the existing arrangements um, will need to go through um, a fairly vigorous uh, consultation process. The honourable member asked the question about why um, extend the sunset dates um, by six months. So it is, the emergency response to COVID-19 pandemic is continually being assessed and updated and it isn't possible right now um, to decide whether the state of emergency will need to continue um, uh, beyond uh, the dates because the, the circumstances and the risks um, are continuing to evolve at a state and a national level um, as well as internationally. If you take, for example, Singapore as an example, for a whole, a whole period of time, Singapore has been considered 
um, a, a really safe place. And in fact, you know, discussions were occurring about whether there ought to be a bubble between Singapore um, and, and Australia, for example. Well, they're in lockdown um, because, of, because of an outbreak. So you just you can't predict. Um, if you cast your mind back to February last year uh, and to March, which is when I think uh, the National Cabinet first uh, convened, early March I think it was, um, when the National Cabinet first convened, all of the advice we were getting was this was going to be a terrible thing and it was probably going to last about six months and that would be terrible, that it was going to last six months. Well, some 15 months or whatever it is now, we are on um, and we're still dealing with it. Now, obviously, we know a lot, a whole lot more. Obviously, we have a vaccine. I've had my first dose of uh, AstraZeneca and nothing happened to me. Um, <coughs> I'm told the period within which I can get um, a blood clot to the brain is between day four and day 20. I'm about day 15, so, um, folks, five days to go. Indeed, we wouldn't. Uh, absolutely, we wouldn't. And I was pleased to take um, the vaccine because I think the most sensible thing I can do um, to protect myself and to protect others is to ensure that I'm vaccinated. Um, so. However, um, we are, as I said, if you, if you think, cast your mind back to um, uh, Singapore being used as an example of a place we could enter into a, an arrangement, um, currently they're, uh, they're in a period of lockdown as well. So there are also um, heartbreaking events unfolding internationally. I know that, um, like many members of the chamber, I've travelled to India and it is, it is horrifying to me to see the extent of the uh, impact that's having there. So all of those things mean it is difficult to envisage a state of normality um, in the near future. All of these things are constantly and currently being assessed and balanced um, to, uh, for both immediate and forward planning. So at this point, the government, with correspondence uh, with the state emergency coordinator, anticipates at least a six-month continuation. The proposed six-month time frame affords the government the opportunity to assess the ongoing risks posed by COVID-19. Should the state of emergency in response to the pandemic be ongoing, the government will have time to determine whether to maintain the current emergency management framework or transition to an alternative response mechanism. Uh, the new sunset date of uh, 4 January 2022 uh, will ensure that these measures are applied to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic while still providing uh, parliamentary scrutiny of the powers used in response to the state of emergency, and it will be up to the parliament to make that decision about whether the provisions need to uh, continue beyond. The date also allows um, the government to review and observe uh, the trends at a national and international level. Um, I think that is about compensation. Um, in respect to um, recovery measures, now I just want to make sure these notes actually add up. Right. I'm going to go back. Um, so the honourable member uh, also raised the issue about the way that directions are published. Um, it is a challenge to find a list, and made the point that it is a challenge to find a list. Uh, in the current directions um, in force um, and that it's difficult to access these. So they are published on the WA government uh, website. We are looking at ways to improve communication and have improved how those directions are published over time. That includes removing and archiving revoked directions to make it easier for the community to find directions and, of course, categorising directions according to travel, gatherings, etc., to help people who are looking for something specific. Um, the directions are also searchable to assist people to find the directions um, that are applicable um, to them. Um, in respect to the drafting, the mysteries of parliamentary council. Um, with respect to the drafting of the uh, sunset clause and the clean up, um, if you like, um, of the emergency management amendment, amendment COVID-19 response act 2020. And once the amendment act is completely spent um, in that all of its provisions have been affected and are no longer useful, then the policy intent is to include that amendment act in the omnibus, omnibus bill and have it repealed. 
Um, the question was asked about whether the government should consider uh, compensation provisions for businesses affected by uh, COVID-19 directions within the Act. Um, the proposed amendment was to extend the current Section 78 compensation provisions to apply to any order under Section 72A2 to direct a personal class of persons to take any action that the officer considers is reasonably necessary to prevent, control or abate risks associated with the emergency, where that direction entails the owner or occupier of the person um, apparently in charge of any place or business worship or entertainment in the emergency area to close that place to the public for the period specified in the direction, as specified under section 75.1i. The Minister for Emergency Services noted that the Emergency Management Act 2005 is not the appropriate vehicle for compensation arrangements. Um, section 78 of the Emergency Management Act provides for compensation in very limited circumstances. Uh, for the purposes of COVID-19 management, it would only apply where an officer has to take control or destroy uh, property. It is worth noting that the Act itself has multiple instances where uh, the power to close a business is provided for during an emergency. It's not a specific COVID-19 response power. To allow compensation for one type of emergency but not others would be disproportionate and inequitable. Um, there is no scope to open uh, the Emergency Management Act 2005 to general compensation provisions, especially where the intention is to apply um, to one type of emergency only. Um, it would lead to inconsistency within the application of the Act. I um, do understand the reason that the Honourable Member would raise um, the question of um, uh, providing compensation and assistance um, to businesses. It is an important issue. Um, however, uh, compensation and assistance are part of an ongoing process outside the legislation that is before the House now. Um, we will continue as a government to respond to the needs, uh, particularly of small businesses, but to all businesses, uh, by helping and assisting. COVID-19 has presented unique challenges, particularly for some small businesses. Um, small business has stepped up across the state in a remarkable way, um, with many, many people putting their businesses on hold to help protect um, their fellow West Australians. Widespread support to small business has been provided as part of the government's $5.5 billion WA recovery plan, including uh, billions of um, uh, dollars in job creating infrastructure programs, payroll tax relief, licence fee reductions, commercial tenancy relief and electricity credits. And that's in addition to the recently announced small business lockdown assistance grants. Over $30 million to 15,000 businesses were most recently affected by the Anzac Day long weekend lockdown. And by taking um, that action, WA has um, avoided the long extended lockdowns that we've seen um, right around the globe. None of these decisions are easy. Um, they are based on expert advice from the Chief Health Officer and the State Emergency Coordinator. And government has taken the view that the very best way, while having appropriate uh, support measures in place, but the very best way to support, support small business and the WA economy is to do all that we can to ensure our community doesn't have to go into lockdown. Um, and the directions that are um, issued in reliance or partial reliance on section 72A of the uh, bill before us are uh, a really important uh, part of that. Um, members, can I um, conclude my second reading reply by saying we are continuing to face an unprecedented emergency. The bill is vital to ensure the safety of the West Australian community and continued support for our emergency management personnel beyond uh, the 4th of July 2021. The bill before us will maximise the certainty that we have the tools in place to do everything we can to protect our state, the people and the economy with both short-term responses to the risks and the long-term strategy as the world continues uh, to grapple with COVID-19. Uh, um, and that if we put ourselves knowingly in a position where we create a gap um, in these laws, then um, that potentially presents an unacceptable risk to the health, safety and financial security um, of West Australians. And so with that, I commend the bill to the House. Uh, members, the bill, the question is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no.
I think the ayes have it. COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill 2021. Second reading. Um, members, I understand that we're now moving into committee of the whole. Yep. He's on the bill. Uh, members, uh, we now move into committee. Um, I think you all know the bill that's before us, so the question is that clause one be agreed to. And I give the call to the Honourable Martin Aldrich. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I, uh, Minister, just, couple, just taking up a couple of things in your, um, from your second reading speech. Um, the, I asked a question about the uh, um, review of the Act. So I've had, I've had a chance um, to look at it in the interim. It's a 2005 Vintage Act. It has a, it has a review clause in it, um, which was, it looks like a fairly standard one for the day. Um, at section 103, review of the Act, ministers to carry, a review, carry out a review of the operation effectiveness of the Act as soon as is practicable after the expiry of five years from the commencement of this act. So I assume if that happened, it was circa 20, 2010 or thereabouts. Um, there's obviously no further provisions that require a statutory review of the act. If, if I heard you correctly, you talked about generally about the, the, it sounded like you were explaining that the act is still fit for purpose and you talked about the State Disaster Council, which I, um, you've reminded me, or if not provoked me, um, to mention because um, we now have the State Disaster Council being treated as a subcommittee of Cabinet, um, which I don't think was, the ever, was ever the intention of the State Disaster Council to be a function of Cabinet, um, but that's the way that the government's treating it, which means every discussion, decision, piece of information that gets laundered through the State Disaster Council becomes um, Cabinet in confidence and, and sealed. Um, um, that's a point rather than a question. But the, um, my question is: is do, does the government have an intention um, to review the Emergency Management Act, and if so, when? The Minister. Thanks. Deputy, thanks, Chair. Deputy Chair, or am I? Acting something. Deputy Chair, thank you very much. Um, so I'm advised that there was a uh, statutory review um, commenced and I think completed just before we came to government, so I think around 2016. Okay. Um, Certain recommendations were made, but they were not um, uh, pursued, as I understand it. Um, there is certainly an intention to meet our obligations to conduct statutory review, but the view is, in the middle of a pandemic, mm. the people you would be relying on um, to have feedback into that review are the people that are managing 
the emergency. And so there's certainly no intention to do it while we're in the state of emergency now. However, I am advised that um, you know, there, there, there is constantly, if you like, a, a kind of um, acknowledgement of the things that we're learning through this um, exercise and that they will certainly be fed into uh, the next statutory review when that's undertaken. The Honourable Deputy. Martin Aldrich. Um, thanks, Minister. Um, I'll, uh, I'll go and refresh my memory of the 2016 review, and, and, but, but I suspect it will be helpful to a point because in 2016 I'm sure the minds of the reviewers didn't have a, uh, a view to its ability to respond to a, a state of emergency like this. Um, and hence, otherwise we would have had 72 capital A probably embedded in the Emergency Management Act or a provision, or a provision like it. And, uh, and, and I acknowledge the comments that you make about um, placing further pressure on the relevant agencies, and, and that is a, it is a good point and a fair point. Um, but I think that once the dust settles, when that happens, um, that there is probably going to need to be review um, considered review of not just this piece of legislation, but we have done a lot of very rapid legislating over the last 12 months, and um, some of it a bit more rapid than I would have liked. Um, but uh, it, it, there's probably other provisions in other acts, and, and I would thought, given this is a um, potentially the principal act that is enabling the government's response uh, and powers, um, that, that, that this would be a good place to start. Um, I didn't have any, uh, any further questions, I don't think, on clause one. It's a fairly limited... Um, it's a fairly... What? No, it's a limited bill. Um, um, I did ask... Uh, I did, one, one of the things I did ask was about the, the expiration date, and, and I think, Minister, your response was... Um, was it was really a, a date because we don't, we don't know what's are going to occur in the future. So I understand there's probably not a lot of science behind the date. It's, it's, it's a bit of a six months is, is an appropriate... Well, maybe I'll put this to you and you tell me if it's, it's a good way of paraphrasing what you said. That, that the six months is... is um, I mean, we don't want to be coming back to the parliament every week and asking for an extension for another week. Um, it's, it's a, six months is probably an appropriate length of time for us to, as a parliament, but prior to that, the government reassess our position um, and decide whether or not these powers are needed into the future, whether COVID exists, whether something else, else exists. Um, and, and so I accept that point. My issue was, um, and, and maybe it's, maybe it's, um, maybe it's, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it's, uh, there's some, some better explanation for it, but the 4th of January just seems, I mean, I know it's six months to the day, but, uh, but I think the, the argument or the question I put to the government was, I assume it would be their intention to then, prior to that date, to make a decision. So there's probably going to have to be several months before that date in terms of drafting a bill, introducing a bill, both chambers, off to the governor, um, keeping in mind that we're going to rise, typically late November, early December. I, I can't recall the sitting schedule for this year. Um, and uh, still with the ability to recall, but um, you know, we're, it's going to. In terms of the decision point for government, it's probably only a matter of months away, three, maybe four months, of actually having to make a call about, or cabinet having to make a call to print a new bill to bring to this place. Um, and uh, and so perhaps if if the minister could perhaps enlighten me with whatever detail she can around how the government's going to approach that. The Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm advised, well, the first part of your question is right. There's no magic science to this. And you're quite right. Government will need to make a decision, I would say, probably within four months um, that, uh, of what we um, intend to do to start the process. Um, I do have, though, a letter um, 
dated the 27th of April 2021, from Chris Dawson, Commissioner of Police State Emergency Coordinator, which in part says, the intent of the sunset date was to ensure that section 72A would apply to the circumstances of an appropriate response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As you are aware, a cabinet submission has been prepared to extend the sunset date that applies to section 72A of the Emergency Management Act. In my capacity as State Emergency Coordinator, I endorse the submission for the sunset date to be extended by no less than six months. So that's, that's the reasoning behind it. The Honourable Martin Aldrich. Um, can I ask, uh, I read an article, Minister, in, um, in the last few days, and I don't have it with me, but it was, um, it was an article talking about the cracks starting to emerge in the Labor Party. And um, quite a good article, quite a good article. Oh, no, no, well, I'll, I'll come to it. I'll come to it. I'll come to it. Um, and in that article, I'm pretty sure, there was um, some reference to a, um, a dispute that occurred between the Director General, the, the then Director General of the Department of Premier and Cabinet and the Premier about um, which, powers, which powers ought to be deployed um, in the state's response to the pandemic. And, and on one hand, you've got the powers under the um, Emergency Management Act, and on the other hand, powers under the Public Health Act. And, and as I understand it, there was an activation of the relevant states of emergency under both acts within a matter of days, I think, of, of each other. Um, it's not something that I've been able to turn my mind to in any detail, but, but, I, but I would have thought, um, well, one, if you could tell me if the dispute happened, like, as, it's been, um, as it's been reported, um, but, but two, um, if, uh, if I would have thought that the Public Health Act would have been fairly limited in its scope. Um, and so the, the ability to issue directions of the nature um, that we've seen in the Emergency Management Act, um, which we are we're extending those powers, where we're agreeing to give the government another six months um, with respect to the extension of time for those powers. Um, does, do your advisers have information that could um, provide us with some understanding of the powers that exist within the Emergency Management Act in comparison to the Public Health Act, why the Emergency Management Act is the appropriate act in which to respond to the pandemic? Minister. Uh, thanks. So uh, while my advisers are providing me advice about the second part of your question, which is not an unreasonable one, I will say in respect to the first part of your question, my advice to you, I, I quite like Paul Murray, but my advice to you is don't believe everything that he writes. Um, and secondly, I wouldn't know if there was uh, such a dispute. And thirdly, even if I did, I don't see it as being germane to the bill before us now. With a try. Minister, can I just clarify, you're seeking further advice. The I've minister has the call. I've got that now. Um, so we don't have a table here now which sets out um, you know, the, the respective powers, but I'm happy to give an undertaking that I'll ask the relevant minister um, to provide that to you um, as a, a separate uh, document outside. Um, you know, I'll provide it to you behind the chair. Hon the Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Thanks, thanks for that undertaking, Minister. I mean, it, it's, it's, I guess this is one of those things, going back to my point about the need for particularly a statutory review of the Emergency Management Act, potentially other acts, because we are now using um, the powers of two acts simultaneously, because there are, issue, there are directions issued by the Chief Health Officer under the Public Health Act, and there are directions issued under the uh, Emergency Management Act by the State Emergency Coordinator. And, and, so, and maybe that's appropriate, maybe that's not a problem. Um, I would assume that there would be differences in the types of powers that can be that can be issued under under each under each act, which brings me back to that earlier point um, about the article, whether it was true or not, relevant or not. Um, the speculation was that there was some sort of dispute over the appropriate legislation um, 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 to deploy in in those circumstances. Um, I know some other members have got some questions, so I might just um, contemplate that for a moment and. The Honourable Nick Goran. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, 
Uh, if you've got a copy of the second reading speech handy um, at your disposal, uh, the version that's been uh, circulated uh, to members when you read the bill in uh, earlier this month, if I can, t uh, the version I've got at least anyway, which appears to be different to the one that um, you have, has a series of dot points. Uh, uh, this is the customary one that is circulated to members in, in the usual way. Now the eighth dot point reads, we must urgently pass this bill by to ensure that the state can respond to the challenges that we are facing. Now, for the benefit of Hansard, there's no error um, in my quote. That is what it says. We must urgently pass this bill by to ensure that the state can respond to the challenges that we are facing. Minister, my question is that uh, it appears that uh, there may have been an earlier version of the, of the speech that might have inserted a date. Uh, we must urgently pass this bill by, insert date, to ensure that the state can respond to the challenges we are facing. Are you in a position to be able to inform the House about this? The Minister. In the version that you gave me, but it's not because a date is missing, it's the insertion of the word by. So the version that I have in front of me says, we must urgently pass this bill to ensure the bit that's missing. I'll pass this back so you've got your marked up version, if I may. Thank you. So the, the word by has been inserted. Incorrect. Nick Garan. Uh, so, Minister, uh, when does the bill need to be passed by? The Minister. Thank you. So, the Honourable Member would be aware, of course, that the expiration of the current arrangements is the 4th of July, so we need to pass the bill before then. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thanks, Minister. And you'd also be aware that there are uh, many sitting dates between now and the 4th of July. Um, and it seems to me that there is uh, no case for the temporary order uh, to have been. In... No? Did you say what you heard? Maybe you might fin allow me to finish my contribution, and then you might make your own reflection. It seems to me that there is no case made for the invoking of the uh, temporary order for this particular bill, not to be confused with the decision of the House as to whether there will be a temporary order or not. Uh, there seems to me to be ample sitting days uh, between now and the 4th of July, which is the date that you say that this bill needs to be passed by. Nevertheless, um, Minister, can you inform the House, can you inform the House whether uh, a briefing was offered to members with respect to this bill? The Minister? Um, yes, it was. Um, it, maybe the honourable member was out of the um, House on urgent parliamentary business when two members um, of the opposition um, referenced the briefings they received and thanked the officers for those briefings. So certainly briefings were offered, honourable member. The honourable Nick Garan. Now, Minister, are you aware that uh, one of the briefings uh, members were told that the government had received advice, had received advice that at least a six month extension be sought? The Minister. So, um, thank you. I wasn't at the briefing. Um, you were, I'm advised. I'm not sure why you needed to ask me if there were briefings if you were at the briefing, but um, yes. in any event, um, I'm not sure if you were out of the chamber when I just referred to the letter from the police commissioner. Okay, so the, the last sentence of that letter says, in my capacity as state emergency coordinator, I endorse the submission for the sunset date to be extended by no less than six months. 
So I'm advised that's the basis of the advice that was provided um, at the briefing. The Honourable Nick Garan. Madam Minister, will you table that advice? I can. Minister. So if I identify it, which I've already done, this is a letter dated the 27th of April 2021, <laughs> signed She's by Chris Dawson, Commissioner for, of Police, State Emergency Coordinator, to the Honourable Rhys Whitby, MLA, Minister for Emergency Services. That document is tabled. You give the call to the Honourable Nick Grant. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Chair. Now, Minister, um, while that letter is being circulated uh, to interested members, uh, is that the only advice that the government received uh, that there be at least a six-month extension? The Minister. Um, Chair, so perhaps the Honourable Member might assist me if there's a particular um, point he wants to get to, because I've explored already with the Honourable uh, Martin Aldridge. There's no precise science to this. Um, the best advice um, received by the government is that the police commissioner, in his capacity as state emergency coordinator, was of the view it should be no less than six months. Um, and so that's the position that was adopted. Um, but there's no uh, precise um, kind of formulaic approach to this. Um, it's about common sense and the advice that's been uh, provided to government, which was that it should be no less than six months. The Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, well, that's the point, isn't it, Minister? Because uh, you've just said uh, not less than six months. At the briefing, we were told at least a six-month extension, and the document you've read refers to not less than six months. Now, that's three different versions of advice. I want to get to the bottom of whether the government's received one, two, three or more pieces of advice. So I go back to my question. Is this advice from Commissioner Dawson the only advice that the government's received that there be at least a six-month extension? Uh, the Minister. Thank you. So I'm not sure we can take the line of questioning much further because um, I've already indicated there's no precise science, um, no precise formula that is applied um, each time. I am advised, uh, though, that uh, the Commissioner, so that's the State Emergency Coordinator, receives advice from the Chief Health Officer on a regular basis with regards to the continuation of the state of emergency. Uh, and future outlook and takes that into consideration when advising the Emergency um, Services um, Minister. Um, so I'm not sure I can take that uh, much further. The Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, Minister, at the briefing that I attended, um, the Honourable Martin Aldridge and I were told that the government had received advice from some unspecified individual or individuals uh, that at least a six-month extension. Now, I'm, very, I'm being very precise here um, for your benefit, Minister. At least a six-month extension. That's what we were told at the briefing. Now, what I'd like to know is that the people who told us that, they must have had something in mind. Now, was it the letter from Chris Dawson dated the 27th of April 2021, or was it something else? Chair. 
the minister. There is nothing else, but I am advised at that point the officers were not authorised to provide that letter at that briefing. So they paraphrased the advice. And instead of saying no less than, they said at least. Um, it was not an intention um, to mislead or to confuse, um, but at that point uh, in time they didn't have permission um, to provide a copy of the correspondence. You have it before you now. The Honourable Nick Garan. So, Minister, uh, when was that uh, permission granted and was it provided by the Minister for Emergency Services or some other person? The Minister. So, to the best recollection of the advisers um, at the table, they sought advice to assist in the matter proceeding through the Legislative Council, and so it was recently, but they can't remember the precise date, and they sought permission through the Minister of uh, the State Emergency Coordinator. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Chair. Now, uh, Minister, this letter from uh, the Office of the Commissioner of Police dated the 27th of April 2021, which you've referred to earlier, ends with this statement. In my capacity as State Emergency Coordinator, I endorse the submission for the sunset date to be extended by no less than six months. Now, a plain reading of that it would indicate that somebody else has already given advice to the government that the extension be no less than six months, and it is Commissioner Dawson who is adding his weight and endorsing that earlier advice. Who provided the earlier advice? Minister. Thank you. So I'm advised that the submission referred to in the letter is a cabinet submission, but again I'm going to go back to what I said before. Um, there is no precise scientific formula. As you would appreciate, there is constant and ongoing discussion between people like the State Emergency Coordinator and the Chief Health Officer uh, and others involved in the management of the pandemic and all of the tools required uh, to manage the pandemic. So some of the conversations, or well, some of the advice um, that is considered is verbal and occurs as part of uh, the conversations that occur, and other um, is formalised through, for example, um, the, uh, the, a cabinet submission, for example. The Honourable Nick Garan. <clears throat> All right, so we, to be clear, Minister, uh, on behalf of the government, you're informing the House uh, that no one other than, the, than uh, Chris Dawson, Commissioner for Police, State Emergency Coordinator, nobody else has provided advice to the government that the sunset date be extended by no less than six months. No one has provided that other than him in his letter the 27th of April. Well, then let's get to the bottom of this because I asked the question. You provide answers about some specific timeline around six months. I don't actually really care whether it's six months or eight months or any specific formula. I agree with you. There is none. That's not what I'm asking for. I'm asking for the chain of advice that's been provided to government. Clearly, Chris Dawson wasn't the first person in the chain. Somebody else had to have been. I want to know who that was. The minister. So I know the honourable member has not been a minister. Um, so perhaps it's not across um, the process by which cabinet submissions are prepared, um, but they are prepared by respective um, agencies. It's also the case, I just made the point, that the advice um, that is being provided in many, cases, in many cases is a conversation, is a discussion and is verbal. And in addition to that, you have uh, the preparation of um, submissions for consideration by cabinet, and then you have formal advice uh, from time to time as well from the State Emergency Coordinator, and that is what has occurred here. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Chair. Uh, Minister, has the government received any advice? Has the government received any advice 
that the period of the extension should be greater than six months. Minister, I'm not sure that I can answer this question in any other way than I already have. The advice that government acted on is the advice provided by the State Emergency Coordinator. The State Emergency Coordinator expressed that in the terms of the letter that I've tabled already. Um, however, in addition to that, there are ongoing discussions, which I've already described as being um, verbal discussions that occur from time to time, particularly between the Chief Health Officer and the State Emergency Coordinator, as you might imagine. There is no other advice that I can table or offer you um, that has been formalised um, other than what I have already tabled. The Honourable Nick Garan. Mr. Interestingly, I'm not, I haven't asked for any other advice to be tabled. I'm just asking if any other advice has been received. And unlike the earlier questions, with respect to a period of six months, I've just asked you a question as to whether any advice has been received for a period greater than six months. <coughs> Somebody might have advised the government that it should be eight months, 10 months, 12 months, I don't know. Nobody in this chamber knows. That's why we ask the government the questions and that's why the government's got a responsibility to answer them. Now, it seems to me, trying to make sense of uh, your riddles, uh, that it might be the case, it might be the case that there's been some verbal advice that's been provided within government for a period of time greater than six months. Is that true? The Minister. I'm going to say this again. It's probably the last time I'm going to say it. I don't know any other way to provide you with the answer to the questions you're asking than what I've already said. There is no other advice that I am aware of in respect to any other time period. Full stop. Now, this might be yeah. This might be an opportune moment, um, Chair, to ask you to report progress and just for the benefit of the House, so you would be aware we've agreed to a timetable of first speeches for members and the next one is scheduled at 3.10. So this might be an opportune moment. Um, to ask you to report progress. Members, the Minister has moved uh, that I do report progress and seek to sit again. I put the question. All those in favour? Aye. Those against? Uh, the motion is carried. Members, I will report progress. President, I have to report that the Committee of the Whole House has considered the COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill 2021, uh, made progress and has considered the bill and made progress and seeks to sit again. President. Leader of the House. Uh, I move that the report be adopted. Members, the question is that the report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Leader of the House. Uh, I think I need to move that consideration of COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill 2021 be ad adjourned, adjourned to a later stage of this day's sitting. Members, the question is that the um, bill currently debate being debated, the COVID-19, thank you, the COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill 2021 be adjourned, adjourned to a later date of this day sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. 
So, members, that means that we move uh, to item six, orders of the day, address and reply. And the question is that the motion be agreed to. This means that we return members to uh, inaugural speeches and the usual conventions apply. I give the call to the Honourable Peter Foster. Thank you, President. Let me first offer my congratulations on your election as, a, as President of this place. I thank you for your warm welcome, support and encouragement, and I very much look, look forward to working with and learning from you as I settle in this place. Could I also congratulate the Chair of Committees, the Honourable Martin Aldridge, on his election, and I look forward to working with him as a Deputy Chair of Committees. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we stand today, the Woodchuck people of the Noongar Nation. I pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the First Nations people's continu continuing connection to land, sea and community. I stand before you all extremely humbled and somewhat nervous, for it is indeed a great honour and a privilege to have been elected as a member to this place as part of the re-elected McGowan Labor government to represent the mining and pastoral region, a place where I have called home for the past 13 years. Western Australia is a great state and I am immensely proud and very lucky to call it my home. It is home to ancient culture, dramatic landscapes, burgeoning industries and many great communities. And as the world is still in the grips of the global pandemic, it is also one of the safest places to be, thanks to the leadership of the McGowan government. I was born six days before Christmas in the very late 1970s in a town called Curry Curry in New South Wales. Curry Curry is situated in the Hunter Valley in the coal fields and was founded to support the nearby collieries. The first miners to the region lived in makeshift accommodation near those collieries and were often away from their families for extended periods. The miners' unions, through local delegates, flagged a need for a town to reunite the families. Their campaign was successful and soon after the, the town was surveyed and formally gazetted in October 1902. The name of the town, Curry Curry, comes from the local Wanarua people, the traditional owners of the area, meaning the very first or the beginning. Curry Curry was a planned town and some believe it to be one of the very first planned towns in New South Wales. I note this fact because of where I live now, Tom Price in the Pilbara is also a planned town, established by the Hammers Hammersley Iron in agreement with the state government in the late 1960s to house miners and their families working at the nearby Mount Tom Price mine site. Some of my great-great-grandparents were the early settlers to the town of Curry Curry. Like many of their generation, they boarded ships and embarked on a journey of a lifetime from the United Kingdom to find better paying jobs, pursuing the promise of a healthier and prosperous new future in another part of the Commonwealth. Not all of my ancestors were migrants from the UK. I also have migrant connections to Germany and to France through my other great-grandparents. One of my ancestors, Richard Foster, was born in Manchester in 1879 and as a convict was transported on the ship Coromandel in 1819 to Australia. I was born in Curry Curry Hospital, another legacy of the miners' unions. Delegates from the nearby collieries had got together to discuss the urgent need for a hospital in town due to the accidents that were regularly occurring at nearby pits and the difficulty in moving those patients for treatment. It was decided that a building fund levy be imposed and a few years later, with a government grant, Curry Curry Hospital was built, was opened in 1910 and still stands to this very day. The hospital has a special place in the hearts of Curry Curry locals, myself included, and it is because of this hospital that I got my first experience in activism. In the early 1990s, the Griner government was trying to close our hospital, and I joined with hundreds of protesters in July 1991 to march down Lang Street. 
brandishing placards and chanting, we made our way to Rotary Park for the rally where inspiring speeches were shared. I was only 11 years of age at the time. Due to the town's efforts, our hospital was saved. Hospitals are important to regional communities, and I want to acknowledge the work of the McGowan government in supporting our regional hospitals, especially during the global pandemic, right across the mining and pastoral region. The construction of, a ne of the nearby Newman Hospital continues. Planning is underway for a new hospital in Tom Price and for a new health service in Mekathara, as well as investments into our country, country paramedics and the rollout of the COVID vaccine, supporting jobs, health delivery and opportunity in our regions. I am the eldest of six, with three brothers and two sisters. I feel very lucky to have grown up in such a big and busy household, juggling responsibilities and schooling. Being the eldest, I was expected to step up and I had my fair share of chores around the home. Dad worked five and a half days a week as a tyre fitter, later becoming an assistant manager to support us all. Mum stayed at home with us children, organising the household and volunteering at school and times at the canteen. Money was tight, but we never went without, and I enjoyed our family holidays to Port Macquarie and to Sunshine with my grandma and granddad. We were happy, healthy, and we had each other. I am proud to be the son of a working class family. Both my parents come from large families as well, and so I was incredibly lucky as a child to visit great grandparents, grandparents, uncles and aunties and many cousins. There was always a christening or a party being held and us cousins would spend hours chasing and teasing one another. There was always a backyard cricket match which I, not the very sporty type, would always try and avoid. Family is very important to me. It is through family that we learn our values, how to treat others, how to view ourselves and those around us and discover our purpose in life. I acknowledge my mum and dad who are here today and I also acknowledge my grandma Foster, my nana and pop Marion, all who could unfortunately not be here today due to ill health all who I love very much and where I have learnt my values and where I get my strength. My parents tell me as a child I was not shy. I was noisy, loud and always competed with others to be the centre of attention at parties, including at my mum's 21st where I attempted to steal the show. Growing up with my mother has taught me that we should treat each other with respect and that everyone should be treated both equally and fairly. This was reinforced during the marriage equality debate. As someone who has happily been in a same-sex relationship for 18 years, the debate and subsequent plebiscite was of great importance to me. At times, listening to political commentators and leaders talk down my relationship as simply a lifestyle choice, that marriage equality contrasted deeply with their personal religious views or worse comments, it took its emotional toll on me at times. So, as children do, I would call my mum to vent. My mum would remind me that it does not matter who you love, that she loves all her children equally and their choice of partners equally, and that everyone should treat everyone equally, including in marriage and in law. Equality and fairness are, and will be, a priority for me here in this place. Growing up with my father taught me that we should always stop and help others that we should always look out for each other, because one day we may very well need someone to stop and help us when in need. Often when we were kids, Dad would stop and help a fellow broken down driver on the side of the road, sometimes changing a tyre, sometimes looking under the hood or giving friendly advice. I have strong memories of my dad always being busy, volunteering for sporting groups or helping family and neighbours in need in addition to his long hours at the tyre shop. Once as a teenager, driving home from a night out on the town with friends, my car broke down. Here I was, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, no mobile phone reception, I was stuck. Fortunately, after a short period of time, a vehicle stopped and the driver offered me a lift home. Someone had stopped to help me. 
This episode reinforced to me my dad's words, and I think it is fair to say that my father's examples have also shaped me into the person that I have become as well. We do have an obligation to each other, especially family. We are in this, all in this together, and we should never leave anyone behind. I believe this is why the core values of the Labor Party have always resonated with me, the light on the hill. As Chifley said of Labor in 1949, a movement bringing something better to the people, a better standards of living, greater happiness to the mass of people. We have a great objective, the light on the hill, which we aim to reach by working the, for the betterment of being, mankind, not only here, but anywhere we may give a helping hand. If it were not for that, the Labor movement would not be worth fighting for. This is why I would later join the union and the Labor Party. My strong Labor values of working together, helping others and leaving no one behind were passed on to me by my family and also my hometown. As a child, I attended, as a child, yeah, I attended Curry Curry Public School. Dare I add another legacy of the miners' unions and later Curry Curry High School where I was awarded ducks. My school years were fascinating yet challenging I was a bright child, however, I was bullied. My voice sounded different. I liked to study, and I preferred to have my head in a book rather than kicking a ball around in the playground. So, this made me a target amongst my peers. Most of my schooling days were spent looking over my shoulder, forever vigilant, and due to this, I developed anxiety, for which I have learned to live, to live with to this day ever since. At school, I would spend lunch times hiding in the library. I would change the route I walked home from school each day to avoid the bullies. I share this with you not to elicit sympathy, but to highlight to you that programs that support safer schools and inclusive education are so important to children who are different. And I know that I will speak out in this place to support our children being safe, especially those questioning their identity. I acknowledge our brave colleagues in both this place and in the other who have spoken up about their own personal mental health journeys. Everyone's journey is different and we should always check in with each other, ask if they are okay and lend a, less, a listening ear. I join with my colleagues in acknowledging the investments made by the McGowan government into mental health initiatives across our regions including the very recent announcement of an additional $14.5 million in funding agreements and contract extensions to over 150 eligible community and mental health services. At the end of high school, I came out to my friends, then to my mum and dad, and then to my extended family. I was one of the lucky ones with lots of love and support to guide me forward on every adventure. Following high school, I attended the University of Newcastle where I obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree majoring in Classics and Politics. I really enjoyed my time at university. It encouraged me to develop independent thoughts, expand my horizons, encourage debate and challenged me to look at the world differently. While studying, I worked, at a, I worked a range of retail jobs on a casual basis, including in fast food, shoes and menswear. I was not in a retail union at the time, but looking back, perhaps I should have been. Inconsistent hours, varying conditions and underpayments were commonplace. Management would always remind you, you are lucky to have a job, so don't complain and don't ask questions. Studying full-time and working part-time, I relied on the income of these part-time jobs to get by, especially the penalty rates, and whilst I was grateful to be employed and to be paid, I knew nothing about my rights at work, or even what award I was paid under, and it contributed to an already heightened level of stress while studying. I want to acknowledge the work of our Australian Union movement in highlighting the importance of and fighting to protect penalty rates, which make a huge difference to the take-home pay of the lowest paid workers in Australia, which is largely made up of women and younger workers. Following university, my first full job full-time job was working in a call centre for Qantas. Thankfully, the pay there was much better. After this, I joined the public service, and this is where I have continued to work for almost 20 years before my election to this place. 
I am and will always be a proud public servant. My first role was with Centrelink, taking calls in a call centre before I pursued an opportunity to work in Maroubra. Working for Centrelink was intense work most days, but also extremely rewarding. My role was to interview new claimants and assess their claims. Dealing with people at often their lowest moments in life, struggling to make ends meet for a variety of reasons, including job loss, job loss addictions or fleeing family violence. I took pride in my work, often working back late, and I believe this is where my passion for serving community grew as I could see myself trying to make a difference. I ended up working for Centrelink for five years, holding a variety of roles, and this is where I joined my first union, the Community Public Sector Union. And I want to acknowledge their work as well in standing up to the staffing cuts of successive coalition governments. Following my time at Centrelink, I worked for the Child Support Agency as a financial investigator and following that for Medicare Australia, where I was a branch manager. After working in Sydney for a few years, I met my partner Sam and I followed him down to Wollongong. After moving in together, we purchased our first home. We were paying off the mortgage, credit cards and with endless cost of living pressures, money was tight. So, like my ancestors before me, and on the encouragement from family, we packed up our possessions and we travelled west to find a better life. When we first arrived in the west, my first memory was of the, of the Pilbara heat, which I would later learn to love. I remember stepping off the plane at Parabadu and thinking that I had inadvertently stepped into a blast furnace. It was a very warm 45 degrees. As we drove into Tom Price, I was taken aback by the beauty of the place, it is truly an oasis in the desert. Northwest mining towns are transient, and as such, many are reluctant to get involved in community. Many come with five-year plans, maybe start a family, pick up a few skills, make some money, and then leave again. At first, we were no different, but as the months passed, and after many conversations with locals, my love for the Tom Price community grew and so did my desire to make the town much better. Working in customer service for the transport department, I had daily conversations with clients about local issues, concerns about the availability of childcare, the road to Caratha was still not sealed, the hospital was getting old, sporting and community facilities were outdated and no longer fit for purpose. Growing increasingly frustrated with the Shire, I decided to challenge myself by running for council in 2009. On the first occasion, I was unsuccessful. Undeterred and knowing that I could make the community better, I got more involved, joining the Tom Price Youth Support Association, Tom Price Tidy Towns and the Nameless Jundamana Festival Committee and volunteered much of my spare time each week. Volunteers are so important in our regional towns and the mining and pastoral region is no different. Volunteers run our sporting and community groups, run countless fundraisers, giving many hours of personal time. Through volunteering, I learnt much about myself, made many new friends, and it helped to combat my anxiety. National Volunteers Week was celebrated recently, and I believe it is important for all of us to recognise and thank the volunteers for the vital role they play in our communities, such as the State Emergency Services, and St John's Ambulance volunteers, who put in long hours in often exceedingly difficult circumstances to save lives. I want to make special mention of the Tom Price SES, Tom Price St John's Ambulance and Tom Price Bushfire Brigades, all who do an amazing job across the inland Pilbara, from gorge rescues to land searches to responding to car crashes and fighting the many bushfires caused by lightning strikes during the wet season. In early 2011, I joined with Councillor Cecilia Fernandez to run a petition to bring attention to seal the remainder of the road between Tom Price and Caratha. This was a priority for us locals, many of whom travelled to Caratha regularly to access medical services, sporting games or shopping. It was not a priority at the time for local government or the state government, and we strongly believe it needed to be. 
In just two short days, we had gathered almost 1,000 signatures to which we gave the former member for the Pilbara, Tom Stevens, to lodge on our behalf in State Parliament. I was determined to champion change in our town. In late 2011, I ran for council for the second time, and this time I was successful, securing over 50 per cent of the vote amongst three candidates. I had the privilege of serving as an elected member with the Shire of Ashburton for nine and a half years, being re-elected twice in 2015 and 2019. As a councillor with the Shire of Ashburton, I chaired various committees, including the Audit and Risk, and represented the region on the Pilbara Regional Council, WA Local Government Association State Council, as well as numerous regional and interstate forums. I am incredibly grateful for the experience to serve within local government. It gave me a platform to expand my public speaking skills, negotiating and debating skills, and I met and engaged with many stakeholders. I enjoyed presiding over the many Australian citizenship ceremonies and welcoming new residents to town. We must have strong local governments to ensure that the success and longevity of our regional towns. Local governments do so much more than rates, rubbish and roads. They work to fill the gaps by providing essential services including health, early years and education, environmental and welfare, to name a few. I want to acknowledge the work done by the previous local government minister, David Templeman, in strengthening the sector and measures taken to reform the Local Government Act. I look forward to working with the new local government minister, John Kerry, to share my experiences to help strengthen the sector further. I was recently asked in an interview what was my biggest achievement on council, and I said, staying true to my commitment of being the community's strong voice, by always listening and responding to concerns, by encouraging council to invest in community facilities, including the new Tom Price childcare centre, which will bring relief for working families, and by championing major projects to the state government, such as the Maniwara Red Dog Highway and the Tom Price Hospital redevelopment. I would like to thank and acknowledge the work of the McGowan Government and the Transport Minister Rita Safiotti for their work in further sealing the Maniwara Red Dog Highway. This project means so much to both the Shire of Ashburton and the City of Caratha, supporting local jobs, helping to grow tourism and business and improving accessibility to the inland Pilbara towns. I have also served on two independent school boards as chair and can attest that we have some great schools in the inland Pilbara. Committed principals, teaching and support staff, as well as an engaged school community supported by local government and the resource industry. I was sad to resign from local government earlier this year, but I know that I will continue to listen and be a strong voice for the Ashburton community in this place. Earlier this year, I also resigned from my job with the Department of Communities in Child Protection as a case support officer, a role which I held for three years. Working with families and supporting case managers was extremely rewarding, and I want to acknowledge my former colleagues across the Pilbara district who work in often challenging circumstances to keep children safe. To strengthen families, to protect children, we need a robust child protection system that supports both families and carers, including our valued grandparents, as well as the staff who administer the system. And I also look forward to working with the Department of Communities Minister, Simone McGurk, to also share my experiences to help strengthen the sector. The mining pastoral region is vast, stretching over 2,201,000 square kilometres, with over 150,000 people calling it home, extending from the goldfields and Kalgoorlie in the south, to the Murchison, to the Gascoigne, and Carnarvon in the west, to the Pilbara, to the Broome, Derby and Kununurra in the Kimberley to the north. There are 27 local government areas within the electorate, including the Shire of East Pilbara, which is the largest local government area in Australia. I look forward to engaging with every local government and understanding their aspirations and concerns. The mining and pastoral region is home to robust resource industries which drive, our state, drive the economy of our state, including oil, gas, iron ore and gold. With over 19,000 local people employed in the mining industry, it is our region's largest employer. Jobs are important to our region, with many others employed in construction, 
tourism and accommodation services, manufacturing, transport and farming. Jobs have been a focus of the McGowan government. The Premier, as part of the WA Labor's re-election campaign, made WA jobs a key priority. And this resonated strongly in my region with a commitment to work with resource companies to reduce the reliance of interstate FIFO, to build infrastructure using local workers and local content, by freezing TAFE fees to upskill WA workers, and by investing in manufacturing. The mining and pastoral region is home to much beauty and tradition, including that found at Kalbarri National Park, Karajini National Park, Murujuga National Park and the Dampier Peninsula, to name a few. The mining and pastoral region has its fair share of challenges. Attracting workers for agriculture, construction and tourism, land availability to address housing and business demands, and tackling any social behaviour and family violence in our communities. Our First Nations people have been living in the mining and pastoral region for many thousands of years, and we must respect their continuing connection to country, the cultural significance of country, and take the time to listen to their stories, their wisdom and their aspirations. First Nations people should always be consulted on what happens on country, and this I wholeheartedly support. I want to acknowledge and thank the voters of the Mining and Pastoral Region for the opportunity to serve in this place and be their representative, including those who told me at the polling place that they were voting Labor for the very first time. Thank you to the leadership of the McGowan government for keeping our state safe during the pandemic and the strong focus on WA jobs. Thank you to the WA Labor Party, in particular State Secretary Tim Picton and Assistant State Secretary Ellie Whitaker for running our strong campaigns. Thank you to the Carnarvon, Caratha, Newman, South Headland and Broome Labor branches who supported my nomination and volunteered in our campaigns. Thank you also to Rainbow Labor for your encouragement and support over the years. As one of the only few LGBTQI parliamentarians, I know that this brings additional responsibilities and I hope to do you proud. Thank you to the Australian Metal Workers Union who welcomed me some years ago with a shared vision of creating good paying jobs and opportunity for all. Manufacturing jobs are vitally important to our state's future, supporting Australian made. Thank you to State Secretary Steve McCartney and organisers Alex Cassie and Renee Portland for your wise words and your counsel. Thank you to the members of this place for their support and encouragement and guidance over the years, including the Honourable Stephen Dawson and the Honourable Colm McGinn, who I have the privilege of working with to represent the mining and pastoral region with the Honourable Rosetta Sahana. Thank you to our lower house candidates, Davina Diana, member for Kimberley, Kevin Michelle, member for Pilbara, Cherie Sibisato, our candidate in North West Central, and Ali Kent, member for Kalgoorlie, for your strong and outstanding campaigns. I had the privilege of working closely with both Cherie and the member for Pilbara during their campaigns, and I thank them both for the opportunity to be involved, including making phone calls and door knocks to listen to and understand some of the major, cha major challenges faced in our region. I would like to acknowledge and thank the towns of Tom Price, Parabadu, Panawanika and Onzo, who also supported me on council and in our campaigns. I would like to thank my dear friends, Torren Peel, Michelle Lewis, Kira and Chris Hannan, Deb and Nudge Walker, Audra and Jason Smith, Mel Farmer, Amanda Yeomans and Jared and Kiri Nicholson for everything that you did to support the campaigns, as well as the personal encouragements that you gave me every single day. Thank you to my mum and my dad for their love, wise words and encouragement, for being positive role models and for travelling from Sydney to Perth, their first ever plane flight, to support me here this week. I love you both. Wow. Certainly, lastly, certainly not least, to our son Roman and to my partner Sam, for putting up with my endless conversations about politics, for supporting me when I was away on the road campaigning or down here in Perth, helping me on polling places, helping me letterbox streets, helping me put up core flutes,
but most importantly, for being there when I needed you. Sam, thank you for always believing in me. The McGowan government has a strong mandate for following the convincing state election result to govern Western Australia, and I am enormously proud to be part of it. To represent the mining and pastoral region, and to be a voice for the inland Pilbara, where I proudly call home. I'm looking forward to the work ahead of the next four years, working towards fairness and equality, advocating to make our regional communities even stronger, whether it being building tourism, industry, supporting job creation or improving community amenity. And I will always stay true to my Labor values. Thank you. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. I give the call to the Honourable Rosetta Shahana. Thank, thank you. First of all, good afternoon, President, and congratulations to you on your appointment as President of the Legislative Council. I would like to thank you all for gathering here today. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation who are the traditional owners of this land on which we gather on today. And I would, I would also like to take this opportunity to, to acknowledge all First Nation elders, past, present and emerging. I come to this place today as elected by the people of WA. I am honoured to serve our great state. I would like to thank the West Australian people for entrusting their confidence in both the WA Labor Party and in myself as the member representing the mining and pastoral electorate. I would like to start by introducing myself to you. My name is Rosetta Sahana, but I prefer to be called Rosie. I am an Aboriginal woman born and bred in Broome with family ties and connection across the West Australia, from the Kimberley through to the Murchison and Gascoigne regions. I'm a proud Ngarijan and Badijawi woman connected to the Gija, and Gundiani tribes in the Kimberley and the Amiji in the south. It is a great honour knowing that the mining and pastoral electorate also covers the regions of where my family come from. This electorate is the largest and most diverse electorate in Australia. To represent the mining and pastoral electorate of WA is more than just a title to me. I have a strong personal connection to this, to this electorate I and I understand my responsibility to this electorate. I will now give you a snapshot of my upbringing to give you a sense of myself and my personal capacity. Firstly, I will acknowledge the anniversary of the Sorry Day today, 26th of May, and acknowledge the special event being held in Broome at the Kimberley Stolen Generation Sorry Day event. National Sorry Day remembers and acknowledges the mistreatment of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who were forci forcibly removed from their families and communities, which we now know as the Stolen Generations. Today is the anniversary of the presenting of the Bring Them Home report developed, sorry, de delivered by Sir Ronald Wilson, which was to be the game changer for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and for Australia. The prominent, the Predominant aim of the forced removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families was to absorb or assimilate children with mixed ancestry into the non-Indigenous community, which has challenged our very own well-being, identity and essence of our uniqueness within the WA community and the world as traditional owners. I would like to quote Sir William Dean, Governor General of Australia, in his submission to the National Inquiry present plight in terms of health, employment, education, living conditions and self-esteem of so many Aborigines must be acknowledged as largely flowing from what happened in the past. The dispossession, the destruction of lives were all related, the new diseases, 
the alcohol and the new pressures of living were all introduced. True acknowledgement cannot stop short of recognition of the extent to which present disadvantages flows from past injustice and oppression." Unquote. This goes to the very heart of many of the issues that are faced today and highlights the need for truth-telling, treaty and a voice to parliament. My father was a child of stolen generation. He was taken from his family up on the Gib River Road, a pastoral station called Moonlight Valley Station on which the Salmon River in the Northeast Kimberley. His mother was Aboriginal and his father an Indian from Karachi, India. After the tragic death of his father, he was taken away and sent to Beagle Bay Mission at the age of nine years old. For those of you that don't know Beagle Bay Mission, it's actually north of Broome, up on the Dapier Peninsula. It is widely known as home of the stolen generation because many Kimberley kids that were taken away were sent there. It was there that he met and married his wife, my mother, Ottilia Paddy. My maternal grandmother, also a child of the stolen generation, was taken from Carnarvon in 1900 and sent on a ship to Beagle Bay Mission her mother, Aboriginal, and her father, Chinese. Like my father, she too met and married her husband, my grandfather, at Beagle Bay. She never went back to her country, however, her family. Her family members travelled to Beagle Bay to meet and spend some time with her, as she was the missing link to her family members. My father and my grandmother never complained about their circumstances. They made the best of what they had and never looked back. My father, a welder, he was a staunch labour supporter and a union man. He was a very proud man, and he raised his children the same way he was raised. Strict, disciplined, taught us family values and principles, the importance of having a job, and wanted nothing to do with handouts. I share this story with you all to highlight the fact that myself, like most of us West Australians, comes from very humble beginnings facing circumstances imposed on us from the policy of the day, and yet somehow we thrive and we never stop on pushing on. I've been involved in the delivery of service in the Kimberley region for over 30 years. During this time, I have worked at all levels across government and non-government agencies and Aboriginal organisations from administration to chief executive officer. It is hard to discuss a 30-year time frame in a short amount of time, but I will share with you some of my many milestones. My first employment as a 17-year-old public servant was in 1977, employed by then the Department of Harbour and Lights at the Broome Port, where I worked for five years as a clerk. At 17 years old, it was daunting, working my first job in an office full of only men. Lucky for me, the other staff were all local men who I was familiar with, so I got on really good. It was there I met my husband at Torres Strait Islander, a pearl diver, Lenny Pet, and together we have four children and four granddaughters. I then went on to work for the Department for Community Services. It's, it's really funny, on Monday at lunch here at the um, dining room there, I met a lady by the name of Kat K. O'Halloran, and she was the minister at that time, and that's going back 30 years ago. It was really, really great to see her again and, and have it talk to her. Anyway, so I started off as a family support officer and then worked my way up to an acting team leader. Here is where I got my first insight in the many issues that risk families, and in particular Aboriginal families, faced on a daily basis. I worked at that department for 15 years. During this time, the department changed its name several times, but to the Aboriginal people, it was always known as the Department of Native Welfare responsible for taking kids away, and that was 80s, 90s, and they still thought that that department still took kids away. Seeing the disadvantage of families and the support that they needed sparked my interest in Aboriginal affairs, and I knew I wanted to be more involved in helping my people. In 1999, I resigned from the department, and it happened to be the same year as the election for the Atsi Kalari Regional Council, which I decided to run for. I got elected to the council and then was successful in my nomination for being the chairperson. At 39 years old, at that time, 
I, find my, I found myself in a familiar setting that I was in when I was 17. I was the only woman in the room again. I was the only female chairperson in, this, in the state of WA alongside 12 men, which included eight other male chairperson persons and four male commissioners. I was not a scared 17-year-old anymore, and being the only, room, only female in the room did not scare me this time, and I completed my term as the chair. In 2008, I was a coordinator with Kimberley Stolen Generation the same year that the then Prime Minister, at the time Kevin Rudd, apologised to the First Nations people, a significant moment of time for our nation. 13 years later, I'm still wondering where to from here regarding the apology. This is just to name a few points of my working life. In addition to this, I've also worked tirelessly in health, space, native title, education, justice, youth, and employment programs. I tell you all this hoping that you find comfort in knowing. Gee, come on, paper. That my whole career has been built while working on the ground with people. Whether it be health or employment challenges, or whether it be women and family issues, or whether it be dealing with land and youth or whether it be just justice system or education. Okay, I'll better have some water. <laughs> I will take the lessons that I have learned from the ground up and I will never forget that at the end of the day, us politicians are here for our people and we must work together with our people to help us to tackle the issues that we face every day. I stand for transparency and accountability within our greater communities, but I must advise in particular, I stand for my Aboriginal community, who have been calling out for some time regarding the ostracization, ostr ostracization and lack of proper and true accountability for their communities. People who have no voice are bullied and oppressed by the very entities that are supposed to represent them on the ground. Therefore, I'm looking forward to working with the Honourable John Quigley, Attorney General, Minister for Electoral Affairs, Honourable Alana McTiernan, Minister for Regional Development, Honourable Stephen Dawson, MLC, Minister for Mental Health and Aboriginal Affairs, and of course the many other members of Parliament, including our Premier, in being leaders in straightening the spear for a, for a precise hit in getting things right in our WA state. There needs to be a focused energy in, into community organisation when the silent voices call. I nominated for the MLA Kimberley seat and was unsuccessful. I was then asked if I would be interested in the upper house mining and power electorate ticket at number four. I accepted knowing that there's no way of me getting elected this term. It was a long shot of that ever happening for a number four getting elected. Mm -hmm. I was actually looking forward to the next term of election. However, as I watched the election updates and results throughout the day with anticipation, I was very surprised perhaps more shocked than anything. Reality finally sunk in and I had actually been elected. Later, I was told that I am to be the first Aboriginal person ever elected to the upper house in a WA parliament. What a great honour bestowed upon me by the election results. Today, I take my place as the first Aboriginal person elected to this house as a proud Kimberley Aboriginal woman. It is fitting that I, that I get to be sworn in and to give my first speech during the celebration of National Reconciliation Week and National Sorry Day. And I would like to think that my place here is the proof of the possibilities for my people. And having said that, I will use my platform to promote and raise the profile of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island women voices to the parliament and all issues that affect my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island community and the community in general. I would also like to take to say this to all you young Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander women out there wanting to make a difference. The best seat in the house is in the back. It's there that you get to look, listen and learn and never be in a hurry to get to the top. This is the best advice given to me by my dad and the same advice I gave to my children. This, that advice or this advice led me to where I am today. It took me a while and here I am, creating history. I guess it was meant to be. 
We live in this beautiful state we call home. We are pretty lucky. It's the best and safe place to be right now. No place like home. Then again, WA has always been unique, and we West Australians always do things differently. Looking forward to playing my role in this great place, as there are many issues that we, the West Australian people, have yet to overcome. I know I do not need to name them. Our people know what is ahead of us, and I am sure they are sick of us politicians telling them things they already know. Even though the Premier and this government has done a wonderful job of keeping us safe during the coronavirus, let us not forget the many other important issues that need to be adhered to that also affect WA people's lives. Living in survival in all sectors of our WA state equitably. I cannot express the motivation I feel and the anticipation I've built up to take my seat and support the WA Labor Party to work together with our constituents and pave a better and brighter future for the next generation. My life has been blessed with some wonderful people over the years, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the following people for their support and encouragement. Joe Grundy, Dr. Mark and Tanya Binbarka, Greg Tate, Julie Cobb, Irene Stainton, Robin Stacey, Susan Bowles, Gemma Lawford, Joan Lane, Lexi Trancolino, and my cultural confidence, Mr. Kevin George, who's here today, and Mr. Donald Campbell. I would also like to acknowledge the support from the MUA. I re recently made the decision to go into politics, but it was the MUA who saw the passion in me and went out of their way to advocate for my pre-selection. In particular, Sanaria bin Sahari, Thank you. The Honourable Carl McGinn, the Assistant State Secretary Jeff Castle, and the State Tr Secretary Will Tracy. To my family, my Sahana Pitt family, my children, Koiki, Tilly, BJ, Kalpa, and my grandchildren, Lene, Mireya, Iman, and Zoe. My nephews, whom I raised, Tunnel, Clinton, Arnold, Warren, and my brothers, Ray and John Hamilton. Thank you all for your unconditional love, your support, encouragement, and for putting up with this old girl. You certainly keep me on my toes. You're the reason why I do what I do, why I wake up every morning with a smile on my face. You're the air that I breathe and the wind beneath my wings. Love you all to the moon and back. I finally say to all members of the WA Parliament, please respect me. My advice, recommendations, and suggestions, and to utilize me for the many years of experiences I have in making WA a greater place, in particular in Aboriginal affairs. It is a great honor that I am part of this group which is made up of people from very diverse, diverse background and from all over WA. I am confident this will help us to work collectively in ensuring all representations of West Australian people. West Australian people's voice, views are brought to the table when we discuss issues affecting Western Australia. Having said that, please do not take me for the token black woman in this room. As the first Aboriginal person elected to this house, I want to set an achievable and superior standard for the next Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander generation that will take their seat in this house after me. I have a lot to offer my constituent and in my portfolio as member for the Mining and Pastoral Electorate and to the WA Parliament. May we be guided by our collective honesty, passion, and commitment to making WA a transparent and accountable state. I am looking forward to working with this successful team. Thank you, President. Thank you, Honourable Member, and I'd also like to take this opportunity on behalf of us all to acknowledge the milestone of the election and your first speech of the first Indigenous member in this chamber. You're very welcome. Uh, the Leader of the House. But by the time I got advisers in here, they settled we might only ask one question. So I'm going to ask that you leave the chair until the ringing of the bells.
Uh, <laughs> before doing that, I will also um, recognise in the President's Gallery the uh, a former member for Mining and Pastoral, the Honourable Tom Stevens. Good to have you back. Uh, thank you, members. And in fact, I will leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. Honourable members, the President. Honourable members, are there any questions? Okay, thank you, members. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. No? Okay. I refer to the two-day communications electrical and plumbing union Western Power strike last week and to the pre-election financial position statement, which highlights, and I quote, a global provision has been included in this PFPS aggregates to reflect the estimated financial impact of an ongoing industrial negotiation and that the quantum of the provision cannot be disclosed at this time pending the outcome of negotiations. And I ask, one, how much is the provision budgeted in the PFPS and what, are, and what EBA wage increase does this equate to for CEPU workers? Two, are Western Power CEPU workers covered by the government's wage policy? And if so, will the only offer being made be $1,000 per annum, as was offered to police, nurses and doctors? Three, will the McGowan and government ensure that further disruptions do not occur if this union does not accept the wage offer put forward by the government? And four, if not, why not? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Treasurer. One, the provision referred to totals $36 million over the period 2021 to 2022 uh, to 2023-24 and relates to the government's decision to employ an additional 400 graduate nurses over the next two years. None of the provision applies to CEPU members who work for Western Power. Two to four, the government's expectation is that government trading enterprises comply with the public sector wages policy. Western Power has been negotiating with the CEPU for nearly a year and remains open to further meetings. Western Power is seeking a fair and reasonable outcome for Western Power's CEPU employees that is in line with community expectations, industry standards and the public sector wages policy. The Leader of the Opposition. Madam President, uh, my, oh, okay, oh, sorry, President, thank you. Uh, this may have been shifted. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, so I presume the Parliamentary Secretary has got it, uh, representing the Minister for Energy. I refer to the McGowan Government's commitment to employ apprentices at Western Power and I ask one, what is the number of new first-year apprentices employed in 2020 and 2021? Two, what is the total number of apprentices, first to fourth year, employed in 2020 and 2021? Three, how many apprentices completed their training in 2019 and 2020? And four, how many apprentices that completed their training in 2019 and 2020 are still employed by Western Power? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Regional Development. I thank you, President, and uh, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. And on behalf of the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Energy, provide the following response. One, it is not possible to provide 2021 numbers in the time provided. 2019 and 2020 numbers have been provided for this response. However, 2021 numbers will be made available later this week. Western Power employed 16 new first-year apprentices in both of 2019 and 2020, in line with the McGowan Labor government's election promise. Over and above apprentices, Western Power also takes on graduates, trainees and apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship scholarship opportunities per annum creating multiple training opportunities for West Australians of different educational backgrounds and electrical training experience levels. In addition, Western Power also employed additional higher year apprentices in 2020 who were released by, by prior employers during the early months of COVID-19 through no fault of their own. Uh, President, sections two and three of this answer are in tabular form and I seek to incorporate them in seek leave to incorporate them into Hansard. Member seeks leave to incorporate that table into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. President, section uh, part four, all apprentices that required their training in 2020 are still employed by Western Power. As per question three, no employees completed their training in 2019 due to an initial intake of nil in 2016. 
Uh, the Honourable Colin de Grosser. Thank you, President. And I believe this question has been redirected from the Minister for Small Business to the Minister representing the Minister for Finance. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Finance. Refer to the $100 million land tax assistance package for commercial landlords announced in 2020. And I ask one, how many applications have been received since the scheme started? Two, what is the dollar value of applications received from landlords to date? Three, how many grant payments have been made? Four, what is the total value of these grant payments to successful applicants to date? And five, how many rounds of payments have been made and what was the average payment for each round? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President. Thank you very much, President. I'll get used to it. Apologies, President. Uh, can I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question? It has been referred to the Treasurer, uh, and so I'll provide this answer on the Treasurer's behalf. Uh, information is not possible in the time required for today. However, the Treasurer will provide a response to this question tomorrow. The Honourable Yuan Sibma. Uh, thank you, President. Um, my question, without notice of which some notice has been provided, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. Uh, question C162. I refer to admission and discharge practices as they apply to mental health patients at QE2 Hospital. And I ask one, are there system or resourcing constraints which impede the discharge of patients on a Friday evening or on the weekend? Two, as a corollary, are there system or resourcing constraints which impede the admission of new mental health patients on a Friday evening or on the weekend? And three, if yes to one and or two above, what is the nature of these constraints? Minister for Mental Health. Madam Pre Thanks very much, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, the following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, one, no. Two, no. Patients can be admitted on any day of the week, 24-7, if, if they are assessed as clinically needing a bed. Beds are sourced in accordance with the state bed management policy. Three, not applicable. Uh, the Honourable Nick Gorand. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations, in particular National Principle No. 8 that states physical and online environments promote safety and well-being while minimising the opportunity for children and young people to be harmed. One, is the Minister aware that as of 1 February 2019, the Premier, on behalf of the state, confirmed his commitment to the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations? Two, is the Minister aware that the eighth principle, principle seeks that physical and online environments promote safety and well-being? while minimising the opportunity for children and young people to be harmed? Three, is the minister aware that public schools are intended to be captured by these principles? Four, has the minister had any discussions with the Minister for Education about the continuing volume of cases where alleged or convicted offenders are attending the same school as their child victims? Five, if noted four, will the minister undertake to expedite such a discussion and report to the House on the government's revised plan to address the national principles? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Child Protection. President, I thank the member for some notice of the question. One to three, yes. Four to five, yes. The Department of Communities and Department of Education continue to work closely to manage the risk of children and young people displaying harmful sexual behaviours in an education setting using the multi-agency protocol for education options for young people charged with harmful sexual behaviours. The member fails to understand the protocol in place to respond to these matters or the Department of Education's role in progressing work related to the national principles. The Honourable. Oh, order. Question, order. 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 The Honourable Donna Farrago. Thank you, President. President, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the Minister's letter dated 17 November 2020 to the Standing Committee on Environment and Public Affairs in relation to petition number 164, and specifically the statement on page 2 of the attachment which states, the decision to build elevated rail instead of tunnelling underground was made after a detailed study of several options. And I ask, will the Minister table the detailed study undertaken? Leader of the House. President, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question and note uh, and wish her a happy World Redheads Day. Um, the study of options is undertaken as part of the business case and project definition plan process. It is noted that the opposition has refused to approve the release of the Forestfield Airport link project definition plan to the government. The Honourable Peter Collier. Oh dear. Um, 
My question with that notice, which someone has given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to your response to question C150 on Tuesday, the 25th of May 2021, and to the Lottery West letter delivered to the Chairperson of Victory Life Community Services on dated 7th of October 2020. And I ask, one, will the Premier confirm that the words, quote, on the basis that your publicly stated beliefs and as founder and chair of the organisation to do not align with to this commitment were removed from the draft letter prior to delivery. Two, if yes to one, why were these words removed and who made the recommendation that they be removed? And three, what component of the draft letter uh, of the draft letter was the chair of Lottery West referring to when he wrote, quote, thanks for sending that to us, Susan. I think that looks good and have only one suggested amendment to paragraph four of your letter, i.e. to remove the first sentence and shorten the second sentence. Leader of the House. President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One no. See answer three of the Legislative Council question without notice 144. Two not applicable. Three, I refer the honourable member to FOI document 309, which he received on the 8th of January 2021. The honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the WA Government's COVID-19 vaccination dashboard, dashboard and I ask, can the Minister provide the current total number of COVID-19 vaccinations administered and the current rate of vaccination for those aged 16 and over for the following regions? The North Metropolitan Region, the South Metropolitan Region, the East Metropolitan Region, the Mining and Pastoral Region, the Agricultural Region and the South West Region. The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. And I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answers will be uh, provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, it is not possible to provide the requested information in the time required, and I therefore ask the honourable member to place this question on notice. So, honourable member, if, if you sign the bottom of it, place it on notice, I will see if I can get an answer sooner than the on notice process to provide to you. Okay, is everyone finished? The honourable Brian Walker. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the report by Jack Jacob Kagi on the ABC's website on 22nd of May 2021, in which doctors at Midland Hospital warned in no uncertain terms that patients would die because of proposed multi-million dollar budget cuts. And I ask, one, is it true that Midland Hospital's budget is to be slashed by more than $10 million for the 12 months from 1st of July 2021? Two, if yes to one, did the East Metropolitan Health Service consult with the Minister or any of his senior advisers ahead of making this decision? And three, given that the proposed cuts are almost certain to lead to redundancies and to fewer doctors and nurses being rostered on each shift, will the Minister call this decision in for immediate review? And if not, why not? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, I have been advised that further time is required to answer this question, so this information will be provided to you tomorrow, the 27th of May 2021. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to Legislative Council question without notice 136 asked yesterday in relation to cost recovery from hotel quarantine. Ask one, is a hotel quarantine person issued an invoice when leaving hotel quarantine or at another time? Two, what are the standard terms of payment, including any applicable interest rate applied to overdue amounts? Three, how many invoices remain outstanding and what is the total, total amount outstanding? Four, of those identified in three, how many invoices have been A, have been issued A within 30 days, B 31 to 60 days, C 60 days or more. Five, what further charges are incurred by hotel quarantine persons when they are directed to quarantine for a period exceeding 14 days? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, one, invoices are issued to passengers after they have completed hotel quarantine. Two, standard payment terms are 30 days. No interest rate applies to overdue amounts. Three, as of 30 April 2021, a total of 5,865 invoices valued at $19.5 million are outstanding. Four, A to C, to date all invoices have been issued within 60 days or more. Five, no additional charges. The Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you. My question, without notice, uh, to which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the northern interchange of the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, the Bore, and I ask, has the design changed uh, since plans for the Bore were first drafted, and if yes, on what dates did this occur? Uh, two, does the design of the northern interchange of the Bore have pr provision for a rail corridor 
Uh, if yes, when will the community be shown plans for how that corridor interfaces with the road network? Three, will the, co the corridor require a tunnel to be constructed under the interchange? If so, what is the expected future cost to build that tunnel? And four, given the federal and state governments are co-funding an inquiry into the future passenger rail needs for Bunbury and the South West, will the construction of this interchange affect the feasibility of a proposed rail route down the Forest Highway and onto Bunbury? The Leader of the House. The Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to four, the McGowan government has allocated $3.4 million towards a high-level investigation into a faster train to Bunbury and potential corridor options will be considered as part of this process. The design does not preclude a future railway line in the centre of Forest Highway if this is deemed to be the preferred option. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. Uh, uh, Thank you, President. Uh, and my question without notice for what for which some notice is given as the Minister representing the Minister for Land. I refer to reports of uh, booming property prices and housing shortages in towns across regional WA and a report in the West Australia on 22nd of May stating there was a 42 per cent growth rate in the price of a median house in Port Hedland over the last 12 months. And I ask uh, what specific uh, reference to, with, with specific reference to Port Hedland and Calgary, can the Minister outline how many lots are currently available for sale, how many lots are approved for subdivision and how many hectares of urban and globo land are available for subdivision in the future, and two, what actions are w Development WA undertaking to ensure these lands are fast-tracked to the market? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Regional Development. Well, thank you, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. On behalf of the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Lands, I provide the following response. 1A, Port Hedland 174, Kalgoorlie 34. B, Port Hedland nil, Kalgoorlie 31. C, Port Hedland 197.1 hectares of future residential land. Kalgoorlie Development WA has 430 hectares of future resi residential land. Since the regional land booster was announced on the 15th of July 2020, Development WA has sold 11 residential lots in Kalgoorlie, 13 in Port Hedland and 3 in South Hedland. They are still all available under the booster prices in these locations. 2. Port Hedland. Development WA recently partnered with the Town of Port Hedland to secure two new structure plans in Port Hedland and is progressing an options analysis over seven sites in Port Hedland and South Hedland to inform the location for future residential development. Kalgoorlie Development WA is currently procuring a contractor to develop the next 31 residential lots at Greenview Estate, Kalgoorlie, to support private lot supply. The Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the recovery effort in areas of the Midwest affected by Cyclone Saroja, and I ask one, is the Minister aware how many temporary homes are required to house people who lost their homes in Cyclone Saroja or, or who have moved to the area to assist in the rebuilding process? Two, can the Minister advise how much of that housing has been delivered? Three, if the available temporary housing is not sufficient, when will the Minister deliver the necessary housing? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Health Community Services. Community Services. Thank you, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to two, the, to date, a total of 19 households, 49 people, have requested accommodation assistance. All of these households have been provided with temporary emergency accommodation. Currently, a total of three households, 10 people, continue to be supported in temporary accommodation. Under the state emergency management arrangements, considerations around reconstruction efforts, including workforce accommodation, is the responsibility of the state recovery controller and relevant local government authorities. The Department of Communities, through the state recovery controller, is working with local governments to provide outreach and case management services to affected communities and identify any immediate or emergent welfare needs. Additionally, the Insurance Commission of Australia is assisting local governments in assess assessing the breadth of damage and number of uninsured households. Three, housing demand is anticipated to change over time as issues emerge. The State Recovery Controller is working with the local government authorities, community members and state and federal agencies to develop a number of recovery packages to ensure the medium to long-term housing needs of affected communities are addressed. The Honourable Steve 
Thomas. Yeah, thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Key Start Shared Home Ownership Home Loan Scheme, and I ask one. As of the 30th of April 2021, how many shared ownership home loans does Key Start administer? Two. Of this number of shared ownership home loans, how many loans are flexible shared ownership loans and how many are fixed share ownership loans? Three, over the past, far past four financial years, how many borrowers have refinanced their properties or bought more shares in their properties? Four, how many of the shared ownership loans currently administered by, administered by Keystart were funded at the maximum 30 per cent of purchase price? And five, what is the current interest rate applied to Keystart shared home loans? Uh, Leader of the House. President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, 3,810. Two, 175 loans are fixed and 3,635 loans are flexible. Three, since the 1st of July 2017, a total of 883 loans have closed or refinanced and 29 have bought more shares. Four, as at 30th of April 2021, 733 loans had a 30 per cent housing authority share. Five, Keystart's interest rate setting policy is to adjust rates in line with the average standard variable rates offered by the big four banks. Interest rates are only one component of the total cost of a home loan, and while Keystart's interest rate is not the lowest in the market, it is comparable with rates that a buyer with a minimal deposit or equity will be offered by other lenders at 4.54 per cent. Uh, the Hon. Jorn Sibmer. Um, my question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs, question C163. I refer to the process the government intends to follow in reneging on repeated commitments given by the Premier during the campaign that electoral reform of the Upper House was, quote, is not on the government's agenda, end quote. And I ask one, is it the government's official policy position that non-metropolitan Western Australia is presently overrepresented in the Legislative Council? Two, if yes to one, by a measure of seats currently occupied in the chamber, how many are considered superfluous to the government's conception of electoral equality? And three, how many seats in the agricultural, mining and pastoral and South West regions must be sacrificed to achieve this model of perfection? Uh, the Parliamentary <laughs> Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, and I provide the following response on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the government has not reneged on any election commitment. The government has responded to widely expressed community concern about an, an anomalous outcomes following the 2021 general election by establishing the Ministerial Expert Committee and has asked it to recommend how electoral equality might be achieved for all citizens entitled to vote for the Legislative Council. The committee is yet to report and the government will consider the options once they have been presented. The Honourable Nick Guerin. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to question on notice number 74, asked and answered on the 11th of May 2021, regarding the roundtable discussion to address the urgent need for new courts for criminal trials. And I ask one, did the roundtable discussion take place on the 18th of May 2021? Two, if yes to one, who was invited? Three, further to two, who attended the roundtable discussion? Four, will the Minister table the briefing note or other documents he received from his staff or his department in preparation for the meeting? Five, will the Minister table the minutes and or documents recording the outcomes from the meeting? And six, if no to four or five, why not? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One, yes. Two, the Chief Justice of WA, the Honourable Peter Quinlan, the Chief Judge of the District Court, the Honourable Julie uh, Wager, uh, the Department of Justice Director General, Dr Adam Thomason, Department of Justice Executive Director of Court and Tribunal Services Joanne Stampalia, Director of Public Prosecutions Amanda Forrester, a representative from the Department of Finance, the Attorney General and staff. Three, in addition to those listed in part two, a second representative from the Department of Finance attended. Uh, four to six, I ask the member uh, to place the remainder of the question on notice to allow further time to seek advice prior to responding. The Honourable Peter Collier. He's given this letter of the House representing the Premier. I read the Premier's response to question C1066 on Wednesday, the 8th of October 2020, and to documents 337 of the Lottery West FOI reference to 20 1862. And I ask one, why was the response to the answer provided by Lottery West to the Premier's office replaced with, quote, one to three decisions on grant applications from Lottery West made by the Lottery West Board, which is independent of government? 
And two, why was the response to question C1066 from Lottery West redacted from the FOI document? President. Ah, the Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. I um, assume the member is referring to his question without notice on Wednesday, the 7th of October 2020. One, ministers are responsible for answers provided to Parliament. Two, as the Honourable Member would be aware, his FOI shows that it is redacted under Clause 12C of Schedule 1 to the Freedom of Information Act 1992 on the basis that the public disclosure of that matter would infringe the privileges of Parliament. The Honourable Martin Lord Rich. Thank you, President. My question without notice or some notice has been given to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Emergency Services. I refer to the emergency situation declarations under Section 50 of the Emergency Management Act 2005 in relation to the Wurrulu bushfire and tropical cyclone Sarosia and I ask one, has the State Recovery Coordination, Coordination Group been established for each event? And if so, on what date was each created? Two, what is the membership of each SC SRCG? Three, how many reports from each SRCG have been provided to government and on what dates were each provided? Four, please table a copy in each of each report identified in three. And five, has an impact statement been prepared and provided to affected local government authorities? If so, please table each impact statement. Leader of the House. President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The Department of Fire and Emergency Services DFES advises one and SRCG Group was established for the Wurrulu bushfires on the 5th of February 2021, and an SRCG was established for Tropical Cyclone Sarojra on the 22nd of April 2021. The membership of each uh, SRCG is um, now, um, President. There are three, quite two, quite long lists of. Um, agencies represented. I wonder if I might um, seek leave to have those incorporated into Hansard? The Leader seeks leave to have the list of names incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you, President. Three, no official reports have been provided to government. Four, and, uh, not applicable. Five, impact statements have been prepared and provided to the local governments impacted by the Wurrulu bushfire. Impact statements are currently being developed for the local governments impacted by tropical cyclone Saroja. Given that the documents contain personal and sensitive information, I ask the member to pay, place this question uh, on notice, this part of the question on notice, so that proper consideration can be given. Uh, the Honourable Neil Thompson. Thanks, President. My question without notice, for which some notice is given, to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Ports. I refer to the compensation scheme for homeowners of Port Hedland's dust affected West End, and I ask uh, why does the state use fix, a fixed price to base its compensation when nor our normal approach would be to use an unencumbered and existi existing valuation, plus, uh, where appropriate, a salatum uh, to compensate landowners where it seeks to acquire those properties either voluntarily or compulsorily? Leader of the House. President, thank you. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The Port Hedland Voluntary Buyback Scheme, PHVBS, is not a compensation scheme, nor is it designed to, pro to provide compensation for changes in market value that have occurred over time. The PHVBS is to provide a voluntary option for owners of residential dwellings within the area of land between Taplin Street and the port in the west end uh, of Port Hedland to secure a guaranteed settlement price following the introduction of rezoning related to the Port Hedland West End Improvement Scheme No. 1, ISI 1. Uh, participation in this scheme is voluntary. The 6th of August 2019 was the valuation date set, as it was when the Minister for Regional Development first publicly indicated that the State Government would consider how an industry-funded uh, PHVBS would operate. The 6th of August 2019 date for valuation was accepted after investigations found uh, there was no other date that would distinguish the West End from other local areas, East End of Port Hedland and other Pilbara locations. The PHVBS is, offer is not a fixed price. At the time the offer is made, eligible residential property owners will be offered a settlement price calculated as follows. The agreed market value of the property as at August 6, uh, 2019 indexed, a premium of 35 per cent of the agreed market value and an amount of up to $20,000 for verifiable transaction costs. The Honourable Yon Sidma. Thank you very much. Uh, my question without notice, uh, of which some notice is provided, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. 
I, I refer to part two of the answer the Minister provided yesterday regarding consultation with commercial and recreational fishing groups on the Conservation and Land Management Amendment Bill 2021, and I ask one. Noting that the last recorded contact with Wreckfish West was on 8 September 2020, and the last recorded contact with the Western Australian Fishing Industry Council, or WAFIC, was on 24 September 2020, is the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions advising that it has had no contact with affected marine park users for eight months before the minister decided to reintroduce the bill? And two, which affected stakeholders has DBCA engaged with on the bill, aside from Wreckfish West and WAFIC, since September last year? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. Honourable Member, the answer to that question is not in my folder. I have seen it, so I will ask the advisers to run it in and I'll provide it at the end of the question time. So I'll allow one more question. Uh, the Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, President, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to community kindergartens operating in Western Australia and I ask, will the Minister provide a breakdown of the total funding allocated to each community kindergarten in 2021 for A, operational grant funding, B, staffing costs, C, linked school administration support and D, any other costs not listed above? Leader of the House. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Um, now, the answer is provided in tabular form and I'll um, seek leave to have that incorporated in hands up, but perhaps if I describe it first. Um, it lists the community kindergartens, uh, then it lists the 2021 grant, uh, salaries, teachers and education assistance, admin support for linked schools, total 2021 funding, term one, 2021 funding for enhanced cleaning due to COVID-19, term two, 2021 funding for enhanced cleaning due to COVID-19, total 2021 funding, including funding for enhanced cleaning due to COVID-19, and I um, seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. The Leader of the House seeks leave to have that table incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Leader of the House. The House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Are there any... Is this a point of order? Yes, Okay. Thank you. Just with regard to a question that I received, response I received today from C166 from the Premier, and he's referred me to Legislative Council question 144. Um, I've asked uh, the Assistant Clerk to check on 144, and it actually refers to a question asked back on the 13th of March 2019 on a completely different topic. So I think they're confused. So if I could get a response to that and a response tomorrow. Seek to provide a response. Thanks, Leader of the House. That is not a point of order, but thank you for the response. Uh, from the leader, the Honourable Martin Aldrich. Uh, thanks, President. Um, I asked a question today of the Minister representing the Minister for Health, C171, in relation to hotel quarantine. Um, I think the um, person who signed off on this question has perhaps misinterpreted part of the question, which is part four of the question, where I asked um, of those identified in three, how many invoices have been issued within three timeframes? And the answer was, um, a to C, to date all invoices have been issued within 60 days or more. Can I ask for some clarification as to the answer to that question? My, uh, President, uh, I read the answer as everything was 60 days afterwards, but I'll, noting that you've raised the, um, raised the point, point of order, I will seek some clarification and uh, provide an updated response to the Chamber tomorrow. Thank you, Minister for Mental Health. Are there any further answers? Uh, Minister for Mental Health. President, earlier today in question time, the Honourable Bjorn Sidmer asked me a question uh, representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, I now provide that answer. One to two. The Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, DBCA, maintains an ongoing consultative relationship with a broad range of stakeholders, including commercial and recreational fishing groups, traditional owners, conservation groups and other users of Western Australia's marine parks. The bill was passed by the Legislative Assembly on 17 November 2020, and the 40th Parliament was prorogued, prorogued prior to it reaching the Legislative Council. In the event that the bill is amended, DBCA will recommence specific consultation with relevant stakeholders. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? No? OK, members, we move back to orders of the day. Uh, and, and it's the address in reply. Uh, and the question is that the motion be agreed to. 
It's the uh, inaugural speech, and I give the call to the Honourable James Haywood. President. I can I acknowledge the traditional owners of our land, elders past, present and emerging, and just uh, share with you all how thrilled I am that the Honourable Rosetta Shahara was uh, elected to this 41st parliament. Uh, a very exciting and momentous occasion, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have been part of that experience. The only thing I guess it's a, that, that does uh, hit me in the guts a bit is that there's been 40 parliaments without any Indigenous Aboriginal people within in this uh, House, and I certainly hope that we will from now on see um, more Aboriginal people as part of this, uh, part of this House. Um, I also recognise the service of our veterans, past and present, for the sacrifice of their families, and I thank them for, the, for their service. Congratulate you, President, on your election, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the work of the past president, the Honourable Kate Doust, uh, for her service. It's an absolute privilege to be elected to this House, and I'm absolutely thrilled. And uh, I know that some of you know what I'm talking about because there are 17 uh, newbies here, and uh, those newbies, uh, like me, uh, uh, I'm sure are absolutely delighted to have been elected to be given the opportunity to serve uh, in this parliament. Today I'm wearing the tie of Edgar Wiley Prowse. Edgar was a senator for the Country Party from 1962 to 1973. His son Trevor is from Bunbury. He's been a servant of the National Party, been part of our branch and a great supporter of me personally. And it's an absolute delight to be able to wear his dad's tie uh, on this occasion. I represent the South West region. Surely it is the best region in the state. We have the best surf, the best wine, the best beer, the best holidays and the best fun times. And you all know it's true because you pack up every Christmas time and head down there to enjoy the, the wonderful things that the South West has to offer. Not only that, we have a pristine environment. We grow premium quality food and produce, and that food's exported all over the world. That's how good it is. It's a, it runs from Mandra in the north if you can call that north, all the way to Albany in the south. So it's a pretty big space and it's a pretty, pretty wonderful uh, place to be. It's a stunning part of the world. It's responsible for about 20% of the tourism business in Western Australia, and uh, that's the largest uh, slice of the regional tourism space uh, in our state. It's a destination. And uh, when I was a young fella, I had uh, some mates, five friends with their cars, and uh, all of their friends all head down to the bush for the weekend. It was their first time, and they, uh, they discovered gravel roads. Now, I don't know if you've ever driven on a gravel road for the first time, but this was their first time. There were five of them driving, and the first guy came to a T-junction and stopped. The second guy slammed on his brakes and just stopped. The third guy ran into the uh, second, fourth into the third, and the fifth into the fourth. They managed to ride off three cars. So why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because the thing is that, that those guys weren't doing anything wrong, they weren't evil, they never set out that day, they were down there to have a good time, but they just did not have any local knowledge. They had never driven on a gravel road before. And, uh, and you know, when we have, uh, as regional MPs, and there's a pile of us here, 18 of us in this house, okay, it's that local knowledge that's absolutely critical to be able to serve our communities. Um, they, uh, that, I guess that story just highlights how important that local knowledge is. And that is why regional MPs are so important. I want to uh, thank the Honourable Jackie Jarvis and uh, Shelley Payne for sharing their stories uh, in their maiden speeches and talking about the struggles as they under, because they understand what it's like to live in, in a regional town. They understand what it's like to live remotely and far away from the city. The problem is when you've got people who make decisions about the future of the regions without actually being there, they, uh, they sometimes don't get it right. And sometimes when people, as well-meaning as they are, make mistakes, just like those cars driving down that gravel road, it can end up in a bit of a wreck. I've got a friend of mine who his baby uh, was born in the uh, car park at the Wim Creek Hotel. The baby was born there because they went to Karratha Hospital and because of a directive from Perth that said, look, you don't have the right medical people there, right? You've got to go to Port Hedland. So pack your wife in labour, in the car and drive to Port Hedland. 
Now, I can understand that somebody in Perth thinks that, you know, to get from Joondal up to the next hospital is not a big deal, even go in an ambulance. Well, at that time, we didn't have full-time paramedics in Caratha, and you certainly wouldn't be driving, you're sending your full-time paramedic on a, on a drive to Port Hedland, because it's 220 kilometres away. So they packed, the, uh, they packed up in the car and headed off. They didn't make it. They had uh, gave birth to their child at the Wind Creek Hotel, which is about halfway, about 110 kilometres away, uh, with the help of some volunteer ambulance officers. Uh, and that's an example of the types of decisions that can get made when you don't have that local knowledge. And that's why regional representation is so critical. We've just been through a really extraordinary election cycle, as we all know, and I congratulate all of the members that have been elected for the first time and the members that have been re-elected. It was a, a uh, absolutely resounding win for the Labor Party. I don't need to tell you that. And I, uh, and I accept that the, that outcome is uh, through a fair and democratic process and the people of Western Australia had their say and uh, I am certainly respectful of their decision. For me, I'm pretty lucky to be here, to be honest. I don't know if many of you would have been uh, counting. I'm sure that the Labor Party had... You guys had plenty of people on the tickets. They were all going pretty well. But for the National Party and uh, our friends at the Liberal Party and, and, and some of the crossbenchers here, it was, a, uh, it was a real stress right down to the last moment that they pressed the button to work out who would be here and who wouldn't. And I was certainly one of those people. Kim Beasley said the other day when he was here that he said, when the election train's going, make sure you're on it, even if it's in the guard carriage. Well, I jumped on the guard carriage as it was leaving the station and I'm very happy to, uh, to have made it. Uh, it's going to be an interesting four years for us in, in, in the National Party, but to be honest with you, we're used, to, uh, uh, we're used to being up for a fight. We're used to having to f uh, fight above our weight range, and again, we're in a situation where we're massively outnumbered, but we will do the best that we can do, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's exactly what would be expected of us. For many of yourselves uh, on the other side of the room, you find yourselves as part of the government machine. You have an op opportunity to influence decisions from the inside. Despite repeated statements from the Premier during the election campaign and from his candidates uh, on the ground right across regional WA that electoral reform was not on the agenda, it seems now actually it was the most important business that the government wanted to deal with in the 41st Parliament. We know that because on the second day uh, of the lower house sitting, the Premier announced the process of reform was underway. We have a saying at the Nationals, and that is nobody expects you to win every fight, but they expect you to get a blood nose trying. And uh, President, uh, or Deputy President, I, uh, I intend to do that for the issues which are important for my community. That's what they'd expect of me, and I will give them nothing less. The regions are full of hard-working people, like Hetty and Herman Crispin, wonderful people who made their way from Holland to settle in WA. They had to clear their land uh, to make their life there, which they did, and grow their family. Uh, they had seven kids, uh, and they've all grown with their families. They've now got 29 grandchildren and 31 grandchildren. Clearly, there was no good television uh, back in the early days in Manjimup. <laughs> Herman's number six son, Peter, and his wife, Denise, are here. And um, I talk about Herman because <clears throat> I lived in Manjimup for a while, and I have to say he was a tremendous... Him and his wife and family were a tremendous uh, help to myself and Lee in a probably pretty vulnerable time of our lives. And, uh, yeah, they really helped us out, and I just I wanted to uh, acknowledge them uh, here today. The real challenge for my colleagues sitting on the other side, who are regional members, is for them to be able to push back against the agenda which seeks to further reduce the representation of regional people on some, I, I, some, I, I, sorry, try again, some, I, I, that's it, some idea that counting numbers equates to fairness. I would simply ask, with 16 regional seats in the lower house, and 43 metropolitan seats, does anyone think that Manjimup, Robin, Mullawa or Coolgardie has too much influence in the state government? The answer is no. Regional people pull their weight in this state. 
Regional WA makes up about 25.5 per cent of the state's population, yet they contribute nearly half of the gross domestic product. We provide 30 per cent of Perth's water. The Pilbara alone makes up for 81.5 per cent of the entire state's mineral and petroleum product. WA's mining value was $174 billion in 2020. In the 2018-19 uh, year, the gross value of agricultural production in Western Australia was $10.7 billion, and that makes up for 18 per cent of the country's gross agricultural production, yet WA only has 10 per cent of the farming businesses. So they're punching above our weight, which is great. And that's without touching on the natural beauty and features of our diverse state. I worked as a television journalist for many years of my life. One of the fun jobs I had to do, uh, based in the Pilbara, was to make local TV ads. And I know you all love them when you go down to the bush, the local TV ads. Uh, well, that was my job, being uh, the reporter and the uh, commercial producer in the Pilbara, which meant at election time, I had to make ads for the Labor Party, the Liberal Party, the Greens and the Independents. It was fantastic. I backed the winner every time. Um, but uh, it was working as a TV reporter that I really developed a love for politics. I got to meet players um, over the years from both sides. Kevin Rudd, Mark Latham, John Howard, Richard Court, Jeff Gallup, Alan Carpenter, Colin Barnett before he was a Premier, uh, and all of the ministers, including the Honourable uh, Alana McTiernan uh, and, and Michelle, Honourable Michelle Roberts, and, and many more. I remember doing stories in Port Hedland about the state of their curbing. Uh, they didn't have enough money to fix the curbs in Port Hedland, despite the fact that billions of dollars of iron ore was rolling out of the port. Uh, Bob Neville, I think, was either the, was the mayor or deputy mayor at the time, and he was, uh, he was my talent for my story. And the problem for Port Hedland is that they were stuck in a 1960s time warp. And nobody from any side of government would give them any love. I remember talking to uh, Eric Ripper, probably the Honourable Eric Ripper, I'd say, who was the, um, he was the treasurer at the time. And he said, you know, these guys up in the Pilbara, they want 50 million bucks. They're not going to get 5 million bucks. And that was the attitude um, from both sides, not, not, just, uh, not just one. Both sides ignored the state and uh, of the Pilbara. And nobody wanted to, uh, no one wanted to, wanted to help out. Then this fellow called Brendan Grills came along, talking about an idea called Royalties for Regions, where 25% of iron ore royalty payments were quarantined to spend in the regions, to catch up on the under, underinvestment suffered in the regions by successive governments over the years. And that's why I became a NAT. I saw how this policy met the needs of regional communities. I've always believed that government should serve the people, not the people serve government, and that our goal should be to promote prosperity and, the, and freedom so that people can enjoy growing their families and doing the things that they want to do. I really see our role and Parliament's role and the role of government as being one of service. Through Royalties for Regions, uh, the Pilbara and many other regional uh, communities were being transformed. $6.9 billion was invested over more than 3,700 projects. It's the state's only regional development fund and it's the envy of every other jurisdiction in the country. Unfortunately, the value of this program under the current government has been usurped, with $2.7 billion of the $4 billion program being redirected back to consolidated revenue through cost shifting. There's a big job to do for the people of our regions. I'm committed to working with you and to seeing regional people get the best hearing, possible hearing in this place and that their needs and their aspirations uh, can be heard. We've been hearing a lot of spin lately about how the McGowan government's the best thing since sliced bread. I get it and I understand it. But the reality is that for many people, we, we still are in a crisis. Our hospital system's in crisis. We have an unprecedented and emerging housing crisis where people can't aff find affordable homes. You know, I know of a, f a family that um, have had to split up uh, 
Dad's gone one way, Mum's gone to live with a different relative because they can't, they can't find housing. They're at the caravan show, buying a caravan so that they might be able to move to a caravan park so they could live together again. I mean, these are terrible circumstances. I know another family, um, single mum with some teenage kids, again, has to split up the family in order to be able to find accommodation. It's, um, it's really a horrendous situation and one that, that we all need to put our minds to and work together to try to find a solution for. The plight of Indigenous people in our community, it's in, the incar incarceration rates and the living conditions of many Aboriginal people is still totally unacceptable. I mean, one of the things I did as a reporter you know, 15 years ago was go to Roeburn and look at the state of the houses and um, government spent money and, and, and done some things, but the reality is there's still a lot of people in that circumstance. And uh, so I congratulate the Labor Party on its win. I understand the excitement. It, is, it truly is a uh, monumental uh, victory and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. But the reality is, I think in this house, I think there needs to be some sober minds and some, some serious thinking about the real issues that are facing the people of Western Australia, because it's our responsibility to find solutions for them. Locally in uh, the South West, I've been campaigning for uh, the fast train to Bunbury. People are pretty excited about that down there. And it's probably not even really on the radar, to be honest, up this part of the world. We've got a train service that's pretty uh, second rate. In fact, mostly it's a bus service. It depends on, on what day uh, you go. Uh, and I'm really committed to uh, that state building project and you'll probably hear me harp on a bit about it over, over the time. But it's good to have a passion, it's good to have a project. And I know that the people of Bunbury uh, and the South West are really keen to see that kind of development. We are lucky enough to have, when the Forest Highway was built, that the Honourable Alana McTiernan was the minister and she insisted, as I understand, that the road be uh, wide enough to be able to provide a rail corridor down the centre at some future time. So I congratulate the minister for the forethought and I certainly hope to see that we can see that become reality at some point in the future. The people of uh, the South West are generally excited about the economic and social benefits such a serv service would bring to the region. Now, there are a few people I'd like to thank uh, along the way who, who got us here. Uh, like many of us, we've come with the support of a party and we know that the party, parties, political parties are made up mostly of volunteers, of people who give their own time because they believe in the values of your party. And uh, my situation is no exception up here. In the, in, the, in the public gallery, I've got the dream team of uh, Monique Warnock, Seb Sciano, Conzo Thiel, and of course my wife, Lee, who uh, have been the campaign team, campaign team in when we ran in 2017 for the lower house seat, and again uh, this time when we ran the upper house seat. Uh, you wouldn't find a better team, and one of the things at the Nats is that we, uh, we're a pretty, pretty little outfit, to be honest. Um, uh, it's, it's, we're, we're used to doing a lot with very little because we've never really had a lot. And uh, so our little team, again, we punch above our weight. Uh, we, you know, made people uh, look, look the other way in 2017 and certainly think, who the heck are these guys? Why are they running so hard? And uh, delighted to have been elected this time around. Uh, plus there's some others I need to acknowledge who ran Obviously in the upper house, it's, it's, again, we all know that it's reliant on a lower house vote. So uh, Leonie Lemmy, Peter Gordon, uh, Delma Beju, Trish Leake, uh, Terry, Honourable Terry Redmond, Wayne Sanford and Cody Lee Down all ran uh, for me and uh, helped me get the votes needed. And believe me, we needed every single one of those votes because until, the, as I said, the last moment, just jumping on that guard train as it's leaving. I also want to acknowledge Colin Holt. He's a fantastic gentleman and uh, the Honourable Colin Holt. Well, he, uh, he is a character, as you would know, those who work with Colin. He's very much a man who likes to do things his own way, uh, but he has the respect uh, of the communities in the South West and he had their best interest at heart. And uh, I uh, thank him for his service and his support and mentorship of me over the time as well. I also need to uh, shout out to my mum and dad, Robin Dawn, Dawn Hayward. Dad, dad was a metal worker and mum was a hairdresser. How's that, guys? Hey? Um, they couldn't have kids, so they adopted me from birth. 
Soon after they adopted me, they popped out three of their own. <laughs> so I've got a brother, Duncan, a brother, Stuart, and a sister, Rachel Hayward. I had a really warm and wonderful upbringing, and I, love the, and I do love them, and I thank them for their love and ongoing support. I had absolutely had the most amazing uh, upbringing and still call them mum and dad and, and uh, uh, have what I would imagine is a very normal family upbringing. In 2017, I found my birth mother. She was living in Waruna. I was born in Derby, so I'm a Kimberley boy. I was only there for about 10 minutes, I think, but uh, maybe one day. Uh, so I found my birth mother living in Waruna and discovered that I had two full birth brothers and two half-sisters. My father, Len, had passed, but my birth mum, Lee Rosa, and my brothers, Heath and Billy, uh, were still alive and well. Heath has since passed, but I had the chance to meet him and get to know him. I've also met my half-sister, Rebecca. My other half-sister, Leah, has also passed. I didn't, never got a chance to meet her. Um, I'm, look, I'm pleased to report that my mum and dad, Rob and Dawn, and my birth mum, Lee uh, Rosa, were all here for the swearing-in, sitting together for the swearing-in ceremony, which is very, uh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful time. Lee and I have six children uh, between us, Brittany, Jordan, Jessica, uh, Jackson, Jessica and Ashton. I'm giving you a hey buddy, Ashton. Hey buddy. And uh, we have four grandchildren, Elijah, Nash, Flynn and Sana. And uh, just finally, I'd like to thank my wife, Lee, who has put up with me all these years. Anybody that's in politics or been married to anyone that's in politics knows it's a pretty hard, hard stretch. Um, Lee has just been magnificent. She's always been there supporting me, always been there to, to help, always looks glamorous, always uh, ready to uh, go the extra mile. And uh, I've never met, really met anyone with a harder work ethic than, than Lee. So thank you very much. Our members, that's it from me. I thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, the Honourable James Haywood, and all the best for your time in the Legislative Council. The Honourable P. Yang. Mr. Deputy President, uh, I move that debate on this be adjourned to the next day sitting. Members, the question is that the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. 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 Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Sorry. All oh, right. OK. Um, members, we now return to um, order of the day seven, COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill of 2021 in committee. Members, we're in Committee of the Whole on dealing with the COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill of 2021. And the question before the chair is that clause one do stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Garan. Chairman. Um, Minister, your second reading speech on the COVID-19 response legislation amendment extension of expiring provisions bill 2021 uh, makes reference to uh, what was referred to at the time as the uh, recently that we had recently been in a three-day lockdown. Uh, is there a part of this bill that uh, will enable future lockdowns to be imposed?
Minister. Uh, thank you. So there's a head of power in the bill before us that enables the um, what's the position called again? The state emergency coordinator to issue directions, and those directions include around lockdowns as well. So while you won't find a reference um, in the bill before us to the specific capacity to issue a direction in respect to a lockdown, the head of power to give make directions does exist in this um, bill. Colonel Nick Graham. And, um Minister, and I'm happy to take this by interjection if it assists. Um, I take it then that that would be part four of the bill dealing with the amendment to the Emergency Management Amendment COVID-19 Response Act of 2020. Yes. By interjection, yes. Yeah, thank you. Now, um, uh, Minister, how long has that uh, particular head of power uh, been available? Minister. So the uh, state emergency um, coordinator has always been empowered, I'm advised. So the Emergency Management Act is a 1995 2005 Act. So I'm advised that uh, the State Emergency Coordinator has always had the powers um, so expressed, so at least from 2005, and I suspect probably whatever was in the versions that existed before that, but at least since 2005. So in that respect then, um, Minister, if uh, this bill were not to pass, and there's no prospect of that happening because, as I understand it, everybody is in uh, support uh, of the passage of the bill. But if it were not to pass, um, the, the power to uh, invoke a lockdown, or in the example you've given in your second reading speech, a three-day lockdown, that would still be able to be done? Minister. Thank you. So um, the Honourable um, Member may well have not been in the chamber, I think, when uh, the Honourable um, Martin Aldridge was making his second reading speech, but he did canvass this. So, for example, the particular provisions uh, that um, apply um, in 72A allow a direction to be uh, issued to a particular class mm. of people. So whether that's, for example, the example that the Honourable Martin Aldridge used was a ship a shipload of people, as opposed to requiring, I said shipload of people. <laughs> people are. I heard it clearly, and I thought it was amusing nonetheless. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, so rather than the, um, you know, the inconvenience and the impracticality of trying to issue a direction against each single person. Um, as they come off the ship, etc. So it, it enables a class of people to be captured by direction. Gentleman Nick Garan. Uh, so, in the absence of this important power to be able to send, issue a direction to a class of people, in order to do a similar three day lockdown, would that mean that there would have to be a direction issued to every person, individual person in Western Australia? Yeah.
Minister. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure if we're getting to the point that the honourable member is seeking to clarify, but prior to the introduction of these provisions in respect to COVID-19, there was uh, the power to issue directions against individuals, um, individual persons, a person. What was inserted into the COVID-19 provisions was the capacity, as I described, to issue for a class of persons. Um, I, I'm not sure if there was something more specific that you were um, seeking, so maybe I'll, I'll seek clarification if there's something else you were seeking. Yes, yeah, so I think, therefore, Minister, um, subject to your concurrence, I think we can conclude that it is important for the bill to pass because in the example you've given in your second reading speech, um, you talk about the three-day lockdown. In the regrettable instance that we would have to do that again sometime between now and uh, the 4th of January, uh, which is the proposed extension date, uh, I think whether people are pro or anti-lockdown, we would all agree that uh, in order for it to be uh, practicable, we need to have the power that's set out in this bill. Thank you, Mr Chairman. So, um, Minister, can you advise the House if there is now a documented framework? Does a documented framework exist setting out the criteria which the government will use when considering future lockdowns? Thank you. So no, there isn't. Each situation is um, considered on its merits. It, that may be something that is developed um, in the future. Um, that's my personal opinion because it may well be that we get into a pattern that is familiar. But I have to say, every time we've thought we understood what was going to happen next with this pandemic, um, something different has happened. So uh, I, I, you know, that's not a government position, that's, that's my view, but um, there is not currently a specific framework. It's what are the particular circumstances um, at the time. And if I give you an example um, that was um, helpful to me, two of the most recent cases that were at the centre of, um, of restrictions were university students. So as opposed to somebody who's not at a university, if you imagine a university where there, are, there can be, on any given day, thousands of people on a campus. The provisions you put in place around a lockdown that started because of somebody's um, attending university might be fundamentally different to what you put in place for somebody who has had you know, very limited contact um, with other members of the community, for example. OK, I think that's helpful, uh, uh, Minister. Now, um, for what it's worth, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, moving forward, some form of documented framework would be uh, preferable. Um, so it sounds like at the moment, uh, to the extent that there is a, a framework, it is the Chief Health Officer that determines these matters uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, given the experience that we have had in Western Australia over the last 12 to 14 months, and indeed uh, the experience of other Australian jurisdictions, I would like to think that the Chief Health Officer is now in a position where uh, he has his own framework that he has been uh, developing uh, for uh, an expert to be able to provide expert advice to the government, uh, even though they are dealing with a, a novel uh, pandemic situation, as time passes and as their experience increases in providing advice, um, I'd like to think that they get in a situation where, in their mind, they say, well, if these particular criteria are to emerge, then it's going to result in me giving this piece of advice to government. Uh, if these particular issues are absent, 
then I'll give a different piece, piece of advice. I'd like to think that that um, might already exist, but that is really a, a series of questions um, that potentially a parliamentary committee could uh, be pursuing with the Chief Health Officer uh, during the course uh, of their work in this 41st Parliament. Now, um, Minister, in your second reading speech, you also refer to, um, and, I, and I regret that the official version I've got is uh, different uh, in formatting to the one that you have, but uh, on the second page, you indicate that uh, due to the fast evolving situation and the possible threat, we, and at the time you're obviously referring to the government, we introduced measures when two COVID-19 positive cases emerged. And then you went on to say, since then we have introduced measures to limit and reduce the risk of spread from another group of infections. Is there a convenient uh, list of those measures that you're referring to in the second reading speech? Uh, the ones that were introduced when the two COVID-19 positive cases emerged, and then separate to that, the ones that you since introduced to limit and reduce the risk of spread from another group of infections? Mr. Uh, Chair, thank you. I don't have that here. I can give an undertaking to raise it with uh, the Minister and see if I can table something uh, behind the Chair. Thank you, Minister. Uh, that would be appreciated. Um, now, although you don't have a convenient list of the measures at your disposal, um, is it correct to say that the introduction of those measures that you referred to in your, in your speech now remember here we're talking about two sets of measures, um, two different sets of measures. Is it correct to say that those measures ca could only have been introduced by virtue of the existence of this temporary law that we're trying to extend? Yes, sir. Thanks, Chair. So I've advised the Safe WA app, the contact tracing uh, app, is entirely dependent on 72A. Um, face masks, uh, I'm advised, are, is it partially? Are partially reliant on 72A. Um, and uh, directions um, to classes of people, I'm advised, obviously, are linked to 72A. Now, I'm going to put a caveat on that. I don't have the list of those measures um, in front of me, so I probably can't take that answer much further beyond that. Gentleman Graham. No, and that's fine, but that uh, answer is helpful, Minister, because the point is, is that there are measures, and you've uh, mentioned three, uh, that can only be uh, uh, pursued or implemented uh, or indeed imposed uh, if this temporary law is extended. So at least that gives uh, members of this chamber or indeed those interested members outside of the chamber clarity. Uh, that without this extension, we won't be able to com continue with the Safe WA app in terms of that information. Uh, in the future, the possibility of face masks, uh, whether we are enthusiasts for such masks or not, and then, of course, the important direction uh, to classes of people. Now, Minister, you have indicated that uh, much of the deliberations that take place in respect to these matters are based on the expert advice from the State Emergency Coordinator. Uh, that's certainly what's mentioned in the second reading speech. Um, and that uh, those deliberations take place uh, by the State Disaster Council. Can you inform the, uh, the House who is currently on the State Disaster Council and also whether minutes are kept of those meetings? Minister. I don't have the list here. Um, I can probably get you a list. Uh, and Minutes go to Cabinet. Don't want to grow. And, uh, Minister, I'm happy to take this by interjection if it assists. Uh, are you a member of the State Disaster Council? Yes, I am. I already said that in the House. So, um, with the benefit of that information, given that you're on there, and I appreciate you might not necessarily want to give an exhaustive list. But can you at least give an indication to the House of some of the members who are on the State Disaster Council and some indication as to approximately how many people are on the Council? Um. Mr. 
Minister. No, I'm, I don't know that that would be particularly helpful because um, I I might miss somebody out. Um, it's a non-exhaustive list, but I mean you're at the meeting, so you must have somebody. Yeah, well, who there's goes a range there. of ministers. There are a range of directors general. Um, obviously, the state emergency coordinator. Obviously, the chief health officer, and then there are a range of um, other directors general and um, uh, and ministers. Basically, I'm, I'm happy to provide you with a list, but I'd be I'd miss someone if I tried to do it off my head right now. Yep. No, and that's fine, Minister, and I appreciate you, you no doubt attend a whole range of meetings in different circumstances. No one's ex it's not an examination here. I'm not expecting you to, to necessarily know all these things by heart, but at least it gives us a flavour as to who is attending these meetings and, most importantly, participating in the deliberations. And you've indicated that there are minutes that are kept and uh, those minutes go to Cabinet. Now, um, <coughs> Minister, uh, has the government received any complaints about the use of the Section 72A powers that we're seeking to extend? Minister. Uh, I'm not sure how that helps us um, progress the bill, but not that I'm aware. I find it um, uh, constantly reaffirming the degree of compliance um, of West Australians. But I'm sure there are some West Australians who don't like some um, elements of, uh, of the directions, and I'm sure um, probably some of those have expressed that in a complaint to somebody, um, but I'm not aware of any. Well, perhaps if I can explain, Minister, the importance of understanding whether there's been any complaints or not. Uh, imagine by way of an analogy that we were dealing with an education bill. And you, as the Education Minister, would like the support of members for some form of reform in the education sector. And unbeknownst to members that there were some significant stakeholders in the education sector who had lodged complaints on the very issue uh, that was subject to the reform. Those are the types of things that would uh, assist members as legislators in understanding whether Indeed, there is some veracity to the complaints, whether the reforms are warranted, whether the reforms uh, improve the situation that's being complained of or might even worsen the situation. So in this situation here where we are being asked to extend uh, this temporary uh, law, it would be useful to know if there have been uh, any complaints. Now, you've indicated that, at least in terms of your personal knowledge, you're not aware of any. Thank you. Minister. Um, so I've got some information um, that I can share with you. This, these are not necessarily related to 72A, but I'm advised the following. These come from uh, WA Police. So 87 files received by Professional Standards Portfolio. Um, now, it's not clear to me someone might be able to clarify if a file is an individual complaint or if there may be multiple file, files but all from the same person, or if they're all 87 different people, I don't know. So, 87 files uh, received by professional standards portfolio relating to a variety of topics, including the G2G pass, the closure of borders and the refusal of entry to non-exempt travellers. Uh, 22 of these relate to complaints against police officers um, for possible breaches of the Emergency Management Act. Uh, 2,896 ministerial files including queries and commentary relating to the application of WA's closed borders, controlled borders and intrastate borders in operation during the state of emergency. 25 of these relate to complaints. And 479 correspondence files received directly by the Office of the Commissioner of Police relating to the state of emergency. And eight of those uh, relate to uh, complaints. I might have... That, sorry, I can clarify that individual complaints. Um, I think uh, in an earlier response, um, Minister, you mentioned that it uh, never ceases to amaze you how compliant West Australians are with respect to what's been happening. <clears throat> Equally, it never ceases to amaze me what information can be elicited um, when a few more questions are asked. So you've indicated that of the, I think, more than 2,000 ministerial files, um, uh, two th more than 2,000, almost 3,000, I think it was, uh, that there were 25 complaints. 25 of them were complaints. What's the nature of those type of uh, complaints that we're talking about? 
Minister. Um, no, I'm sorry, I don't have that here. Um, I could undertake to. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, in the um, uh, information that I just provided, I gave kind of a range of things. Um, so, res in respect to ministerial correspondence, for example. Um, I talked about you know, queries relating to the borders, controlled borders, intrastate borders during a state of emergency. So it's across that um, band of issues. I don't have anything more specific um, about than other than what I've given. I can undertake um, to raise it with the relevant minister um, to see if more particulars could be provided, but I don't have access to that here. And if we can just take the uh, 25 complaints that relate uh, that to fall under the ca category of ministerial files, um, are they all under the one minist ministry, or is it multiple ministries? Yes. As I, as I said, um, when you first, thank you. When you first asked the question, the information I have in front of me is in respect to WA Police. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Minister. No, I did. Uh, I recall you mentioning that. I thought that was in respect to the 87 files for professional standards. I now understand that the uh, more than 2,000 ministerial files also relate to the Minister for Police. And then I think there was a third category. We talked about correspondence. Right. Now, in terms of the commissioner's correspondence, there was also um, a number provided in terms of complaints. I think it might have been eight. Yeah. So what we're really looking for here then, uh, Minister, is uh, of the 25 complaints uh, that for, come from the ministerial files and of the eight complaints that come from the Commissioner's correspondence and of the 87 files that are with professional standards, what we really want to know is um, who has undertaken any investigation into those complaints and most importantly, have any of the complaints been sustained? Now, what will be the process for us to get that information? I stand up and advise um, the following. Um, so WA Police Force has established a complaints process in relation to any alleged police misconduct. Any identified breaches are investigated or oversighted by the professional standards portfolio. Officers are investigated against statutory offences the West Australian Police Force policy and the Code of Conduct. All investigations undertaken by the West Australian Police Force are oversighted by the Corruption and Crime Commission. Under Section 21A of the Corruption, Crime and Misconduct Act, the Commissioner of Police must report matters that concern or may concern reviewable police action. Anyone else, including members of the public, may also report alleged police misconduct to the Commission. Once an allegation is assessed, the Commission will decide whether to investigate or take action itself investigate or take action in cooperation with an independent agency or appropriate authority, refer the matter to an independent agency or appropriate authority for action, or take no action, in which case the Commission will advise um, whoever made the report. Yep. So, Minister, that's a helpful summary of the process. Um, what I'm keen to know is what will be the process for us as a House to get the information as to which of the complaints have been investigated and which ones have been sustained. Minister. Thanks, Chair. I don't have that here. Again, I can make an undertaking that I'll ask, um, uh, I'll pass on the, to, to the relevant minister your request, um, and I'm, I'm happy to give you that undertaking. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Minister, um, the second reading speech that uh, you delivered to the House uh, earlier this month stated that Section 72, capital A, powers are essential for the government's implementation of physical distancing measures and makes reference to social venues. Social venues. Um, when you mentioned social venues, was it intended to capture uh, Optus Stadium?
Minister. Thank you. Um, so I'm advised that um, Optus Stadium, for example, but indeed HBF Stadium as well, RAC Arena as well, or the similar kinds of um, venues, are captured under 72A in respect to um, social um, venues. gatherings. The Honourable Nick Graham. Now, Minister, we've just been talking about the, pro the uh, notion of complaints and whether the government's received any complaints, and you've kindly indicated that you'll uh, take that away and have a discussion with the uh, new Minister for Police and uh, see if we can't get to the bottom of whether there have been any complaints that have been sustained. Um, now, uh, the type of uh, and this is much more of a low-level complaint than the type of matters that I'm hoping you're going to get to the bottom of with uh, your friend, the Minister for Police. But um, the type of complaint that I must say that I have received um, uh, frequently over the course of the last uh, 12 months is a complaint with respect to the varying uh, decisions for um, venue capacity at Optus Stadium. And uh, as, as a member, albeit not necessarily one who uh, goes out of his way to defend anything that the government of the day has been doing, um, it has been very difficult to explain to constituents what the uh, methodology has been, uh, or indeed, as we discussed earlier, potentially some form of framework to justify why on any particular day 30,000 Western Australians can gather at Optus Stadium. Uh, on a different day, it might be 45,000, and indeed on another day, it might be up to 60,000. And to explain to them how that is possible um, or justified with respect to uh, social physical distancing measures um, when they are then expected to pack in like sardines on some of our Transperth trains. And it has been difficult to, to explain to those constituents um, why it would be physically safe to have 30,000 people at Optus Stadium but have those same 30,000 people uh, all on top of each other on, on a train thereafter. Um, is that something that uh, uh, you're able to assist the House on in terms of has, have things improved? so that now that we have actually got some form of guidelines or understanding as to when we will be uh, getting into that situation with those type of restrictions again. Uh, there's obviously been some uh, concerns in recent times about a, a new matter emerging out of uh, Victoria. Um, and uh, as we know, that might continue on for some time yet. Uh, but most uh, ordinary West Australians, particularly football-loving ones, including those who like the West Coast Eagles, um, they would they would be keen they would they would be keen they would be keen, unruly interjection by the deputy leader um, those those uh, those members would be keen and those ordinary constituents would be keen to have some understanding uh, about the rationale behind those type of restrictions minister Thank you. so I can give you a broad overview because that advice is provided by the chief health officer whose advisers are not here. This is a, a bill handled by um, police. So the Chief Health Officer provides um, specific advice about seated entertainment venues. Um, it, it includes things like and is guided by things like um, forward-facing seats um, are different to people kind of moving around or um, uh, sitting in groups where they face each other. Um, it will depend on the COVID risk at the time. It will depend on whether it's um, a new variant, what, what variant it is of, of the COVID risk, um, what the degree of community spread is, um, for example, um, you know, where we are in the period of a particular set of directions. Um, the Chief Health Officer publishes that advice at the time and tries in that advice that he publishes to explain why he's um, adopted the particular view he has about the particulars of the circumstances at the time. That's probably as far as I can take it without um, advisers from health um, here. Obviously, the Chief Health Officer um, is always looking to maximise public safety, but has to balance uh, a whole range of things in providing that advice. The Honourable Victor on calls one. 
Yeah, thank you, um, Mr Chairman. All right, well, look, again, uh, perhaps, Minister, that's something that uh, a parliamentary committee might be able to interrogate further with the Chief Health Officer. It is interesting, um, and perhaps it's useful that um, you've got the uh, conduct, uh, the responsibility of the passage of this bill in the Legislative Council, uh, given that you're on the uh, uh, State Disaster Council, um, because um, uh, next time that uh, you're provided with a bit of advice about forward-facing seats and the distinction between that and seats that face each other, um, a conscientious member of the council might like to ask the uh, advisers at the time um, how that helps us, given that whilst you might sit at the, uh, at the match and have seats facing forward, um, only at the end of the match to go onto the Transperth train and have seats facing each other, uh, at particular parts on different types of uh, different types of trains, so the uh, the relevant advisor might like to contemplate uh, those type of things because of those type of um, peculiarities um, that do leave a few West Australians scratching their heads at times. I do, honourable member, we take an interjection. I do this at my peril because I don't want to take you down another path that I don't need to. But by, by interjection, can I just say there is not a single perfect, neat solution to this. We all wish there was, um, but there isn't. Mm. Um, now, Minister, uh, in your uh, second reading speech, um, you make mention, and you did mention this further uh, earlier this afternoon, that uh, the Section 72A power is uh, important because it facilitates the use of the SAFE WA app. Um, what measure is the government uh, using to assess whether this app is actually being used or not? Minister. Um, so, honourable member, we did have a um, contribution to the debate um, earlier. I think it was in the comments of the honourable Peter Collier, um, who had asked for some data in respect to um, Safe WA app statistics. Um, and so, the um, scans are measured. So, your, if your question was, how do we know it's being used? Well, it's because the scans um, of the app are being measured. Um, there are individual registrations, there are business registrations as well, um, and then um, scans are measured um, per month, so then they reflect total scans per month, not necessarily unique users per month. Now, what is not kept in those registers, and this was, uh, the Honourable Peter Collier referred to this in his contribution to the second reading debate, is the paper-based um, registers. Um, but uh, the information that's asked of a user upon registration um, is you know, the, your first name and your last name and the mobile um, number. The usability um, is um, immediate. So as soon as the user scans a QR code and gets that little ding and the green confirmation screen, the scan information is stored um, in the database, able to be um, used by the contact tracing team um, should it be required? Now, um, Minister, anecdotally, my um, observation is that the, uh, the app is being inconsistently used 
Um, so my question is, um, what offence what offence is um, committed if a person neither um, signs in via the app or the paper registry? Minister. Yeah, thank you. So, in respect to penalties, um, businesses uh, that don't, um, ma you know, use the um, register are um, subject to penalties, uh, including a fine of up to fifty thousand dollars for an individual, two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a body corporate. Um, or 12 months imprisonment. Infringement notices can also be issued. Um, and I am advised that if you... So what, your question was, what offence is caused if you don't do it? So it's a breach of a direction. The police can issue infringements. I'm advised that no one has been charged. The focus is on encouraging compliance rather than taking a kind of heavy-handed um, approach by um, charging someone. Uh, Mr Chairman, um, through you to the Minister, I've just got one further um, area to pursue uh, under Clause 1, uh, and then uh, my remaining questions really pertain to uh, Clauses 4 and 5 found in Part 2. They might be conveniently all dealt with in a job lot under Clause 3. Um, now, my question, Minister, is that in your second reading speech you referred to the government continuing to uh, make its decisions based on the best available health advice. Um, you've also referred to the fact that um, uh, the Chief Health Officer does, um, from time to time, uh, document his advice in writing. Uh, is the written advice uh, received by government from the Chief Health Officer uh, before or after uh, he speaks to the Premier? Minister. Um, Chair, I don't know the answer to that, and the people here wouldn't know the answer to that, so I'm not in a position to uh, answer that question. Members, the question is clause one. Um, do stand as printed. Do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. 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 The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Indication referred to clauses before three. three. Um, the question is clause two do stand as printed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Question is clause three do stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Aran. Minister, my questions here re re uh, relate to sections 318 and 300 and 38B of the Criminal Code, so I'll deal with them um, here under section uh, under clause three. My question is: How many charges have occurred under sections 318 and 338B of the Criminal Code in relation to threats or assaults against police officers since Ascent Day on the 3rd of April 2020? Minister. Thanks, 
Chair. So, since the 4th of April 2020 to the 3rd of April 2021, uh, 16 people have been charged with 24 offences of assault public officer COVID-19 related under Section uh, 318 of the Code. No people have been charged with threats under uh, 338B2 of the Code. Gentleman Grun. Um, I was quickly scribbling that down, Minister. So it's 16 people with regard to section 318 and zero with regard to 338B? Correct. 16 charged with 24 offences under 318 and zero under 338. Okay. Now, Minister, um, that's interesting because um, at the briefing that uh, I attended, the information that was provided suggested that there were 19 people charged with 28 offences. <laughs> Can we just clarify the di uh, yeah, difference? Yeah, there's an explanation for that. Minister. Minister. Chair, thank you. So three persons and four offences have been removed. These offences, although occurring during the pandemic and involving threatening COVID at the time of assault, were prior to the increased penalty provisions. Okay, so um, when were they removed and whose decision was it to remove them? Thanks, Chair. So I'm advised subsequent to the briefing, the briefing information was updated. I'm advised that the updated information was provided to the Honourable Peter Collier. It may well have been um, provided to you, but I, I can't confirm that, but that's what I'm advised. Talking about you. Um, yep. The um, updated information out of the briefing, numbers of charges and things, I'm advised. Yeah. Mine went to, um, I think, uh, yep. Now, Minister, uh, I wonder how it's possible to um, have any confidence in these uh, figures. The reason I ask is because uh, last year you were asked a question by the Honourable Martin Aldridge. Um, there was a question on notice, so I can imagine being a question on notice directed to, to uh, the Attorney-General via you, you would have had an incredible amount of input into the uh, answer. Um, for the benefit of Hansard, that it was sarcastic. Um, <laughs> now, Minister, um, uh, whether you like it or not, I guess you take responsibility for the answer that the Honourable John Quigley has provided. And his answer to the identical question that I just asked you, the identical question authored by the Honourable Martin Aldridge, was as follows. The relevant provisions of Criminal Code sections 318.1d and 338b relate to the general defined term public officer, and as such the type of public officer involved is not recorded when each charge is lodged with the court. The Department of Justice has advised that staff would be required to review each individual case to investigate how many police officers were among the public officers allegedly offended against during the cited period. Such a manual review of each case would not necessarily provide the information requested because the type of officer is not always included in the charge description recorded. Consequently, Minister, I ask, um, how do we now know that the 16 people with the 24 charges is accurate? What has been the source of that information?
Lisa. Mm, but it was subsequent to the briefing, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So I'm advised that it came to the attention of someone that there was uh, potentially an error in the numbers. And so Can police were it? asked to do that manual review to check those numbers. And that's where um, the um, three um, removals were made. So um, I'm happy to give an undertaking that if I gave the wrong answer at the time, um, I'll, uh, I'll you know, make an apology to the House and correct it. But I actually don't think it was wrong at the time. I think it said we didn't want to do the manual, um, the <laughs> extensive manual investigation at a time of pandemic. Um, but as I understand it, when it became clear that there was perhaps a discrepancy in the numbers, that review was done. So, Minister, I understand how the distinction between the 19 people and the 16 people was ascertained because of the manual review. Um, but does that then suggest that there is some kind of uh, electronic database that allows the department to assess the information at first instance minus the review? In other words, where did the 19 people come from at first instance? Presumably that wasn't a manual review. Chair, so I'm advised that um, the process is um, one as highly sophisticated and complicated as using keywords. And so you put in the keyword COVID and you get a list perhaps this wide. And then by manual review, you can narrow that down to what is actually captured for the purposes um, that we're talking about now. Members, noting the time, I'm required to report progress to the House. President, the Committee of the Whole has considered the COVID-19 Response Legislation Amendment Extension of Expired Provisions Bill 2021 made progress and seeks to sit again. Leader of the House. Members, the question is that the report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, members noting the time. Are there any member's statements? I give the call to the Honourable Darren West. Thank you, President. Uh, very briefly tonight, I just wanted to make the House and everyone else in Western Australia, I know there are thousands of people who watch the live feed of uh, the Legislative Council, but to let them all know about an event that happened in Kalbarri yesterday where all the business community uh, came out in force uh, from an initiative from Melissa Finlay from Finlay's Kalbarri. Got about 200 people to line up down on the Kalbarri foreshore and get this amazing photo with a boat in the background to let everybody know that the town of Kalbarri is back up and about and open for business. Now this is important because of the damage that happened to that community as a result of tropical cyclone Saroja and we all heard about the damage. Kalbarri is back open and they need your support. And I think it's uh, great that the ABC Midwest and Wheatbelt this morning made a special point, Michelle Stanley's program, to talk about um, the business community there and how everyone's pulled together to get this fantastic tourism town back up and about and open. Members, you won't find many better places to have a holiday in Western Australia than Kalbarri as we move towards the shortest day of the year and the mercury starts to plunge. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great community. It's a great place for a holiday. 
we've got a skywalk, we've got gorges, we've got fishing tours, we've got rock lobster tours. We've got beautiful weather up there in a great community. So please, members, when you're planning your mid-year holiday, consider Calbarry and tell your friends because Calbarry needs you. <coughs> members, uh, I have a number of messages. Message number six. Message number six. Uh, the Legislative Assembly, having this day passed the Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Bill 2021, presents the same to the Legislative Council for its concurrence. The Parliamentary Secretary for Regional Development, to President, the Minister for Regional Development. President, I move that the bill contained in Legislative Assembly number six be now read a first time. Members, the question is be the bill be read a first time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Building and Construction Industry Security of Payment Bill 2021, first reading. Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Regional Development. Madam President, I, oh, President, I move that the bill be now read a second time. Today is a historic day for all participants in the building and construction industry in Western Australia. In August 2016, the WA Labor Party, when in opposition, made a promise that if elected, we would pursue a bold reform agenda to provide a fairer system for all persons who carry out construction work or supply related goods and services in the industry. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues in the other place, the Honourable Bill Johnson, MLA, for starting this significant reform, the Honourable John Quigley, MLA, Attorney General, for his work in in attempting to pass these important reforms in the last parliament, and the Honourable Amber Jade Sanderson, MLA, Minister for Commerce, for commandeering this, the bill through the House. But it is with great privilege that I now seek to deliver on our promises to the people of this state. Aside from some technical drafting changes to improve the operation and clarity of various provisions, this bill is substantially the same bill as was introduced into this place in November 2020, but which subsequently lapsed. The building and construction industry is a vital part of our economy, providing the jobs, housing and critical infrastructure to meet the challenging needs, changing needs of all West Australians. The industry is also a significant source of employment and income for both the West Australian and Australian economies. It hosts the largest number of small businesses in this state, with hundreds of thousands of people earning a living through the building and construction industry. Our election commitment was made in recognition of the fact that the state's construction industry has a long history of businesses, employees and their families suffering significant financial losses due to non-payment and mistreatment of hands of unscrupulous, at the hands of unscrupulous industry participants. In many cases, these businesses provide their own capital up front for materials and labour so that when the person that they are contracting to does not pay or goes bust, the consequences can be absolutely devastating and can have ripple effects throughout the community. These include not being able to pay staff, owing large debts, such that people cannot even re ever restart in the industry again, relationship breakdowns and even suicide. This is a problem of security of payment and it has been and continues to be a blight on our state. The problem of security of payment is one with far-reaching ramifications, not only for industry participants, but also across the border community. It weakens the industry and fundamental st fundamentally stifles innovation, investment and economic growth. It makes sense that if businesses could not guarantee that they will be paid for the work they do, then they will have more confidence to build if they do have it. Uh, sorry. It makes sense that if businesses could guarantee that they will get paid for the work they do, then they will have more confidence to build and expand. If they can have security of payment, then they will be in a financial position to create job opportunities for staff, trades and apprentices. The end result will be getting even more West Australians into jobs and providing more opportunities for our young people to get their first job. Security of payment can provide certainty that business needs to grow and thrive, irrespective of the particular economic situation of the day. Unfortunately, the current reality is that businesses, in particular small businesses, have to battle with a constant fear of not getting paid on time or at all, and without access to the most effective rights and protections under the law. If these businesses don't get paid, then often their workers and suppliers don't get paid. Unfortunately, recent events involving the external administration of the Pindan Group and the uncertainty facing its subcontractors provides a clear indication on why these reforms are needed. Like my colleagues in the other place, I am proud to be part of a Labor government which is doing something about this. I stand here today to deliver on our commitment. This bill will improve security of payment and fairness across the West Australian building and construction industry. 
This bill is a result of an incredible breadth and depth of consultation across all sectors of the industry. I take this opportunity to thank those at all levels of the building and construction industry for their engagement in the consultation progress, process and acknowledge the productive and constructive input provided by a large number of groups and stakeholders into the development of this bill. I also wish to thank Mr John Fiocco and my colleague, the Honourable Matthew Swinburne MLC, for spearheading the initial review process. Following his re review, Mr Fioco recommended a number of reforms to the government, including adopting many of the recommendations from the National Review into the Security of Payment Laws, conducted by Mr John Murray AM on behalf of the Commonwealth Government. Mr Fioco recommended, and this government has accepted, that Western Australia's Security of Payment Laws must change and should be made more consistent with the East Coast model, which is based on the New South Wales legislation. The principle of greater national consistency in this context is, context is an important one, as it will ensure that if you carry out the work, the law will support you to get paid, regardless of which state or territory you operate in. As a result, the bill will implement a substantial package of law reform to ensure all participants in the building and construction industry of Western Australia can be confident of getting paid on time and every time for the work that they do. It does not matter if you are a small business or you are contracting with big companies, if you do the work, you have equal rights to get paid. I will now address some of the major reforms that will be introduced. The bill will establish, for the first time in Western Australia, a new framework of security of payment laws that over time will replace the existing Construction Contracts Act 2004, known as the CCA. The CCA was the first piece of security of payment legislation ever introduced into Western Australia by the Gallup government as a vital foundation for resolving construction disputes. In fact, Minister McTiernan was the minister who introduced the then Construction Contracts Bill in March of 2004. Whilst the CCA was absolutely revolutionary at the time for Western Australia, it is clear that in current times many challenges faced by businesses in getting paid are not adequately served by the existing legislation. The law needs to keep up the pace with the speed to get up the pace with the speed of change in this dynamic sector of our economy. It was made clear to Mr Fioco, as well as Mr Murray in, his, in this, his review, that legislation based on preserving the commercial bargain struck between parties has not always achieved the right outcome. In an industry plagued by inequality of bargaining power, unfair risk allocation and lengthy and delayed payment times. It was a Labor government who first addressed the problem for security of payment back in 2004 and 17 years later another Labor government stands ready to tackle it once again. Western Australian contractors will now have access to the same rights and protections under security of payment laws that their eastern states counterparts have had for many years now. Crucially, part two of the bill will establish a statutory right to receive payment and an effective process to recover delayed payments through rapid adjudication and or court proceedings. This will provide more transparency and structure to issues such as dates for claims, approvals and payments. The bill will require timely engagement in the payment process and impose significant consequences for failure to do so. One of the biggest criticisms of the CCA has been that often subcontractors are not properly informed as to why payments are being withheld or delayed. They are left to either wait until payment is due to find out if they will be paid the full amount claimed or commence an adjudication to only then discover that the full reasons for non-payment. This does not guarantee prompt payment and leaves the party who carried out the work in the unenviable position of chasing payment or commencing an adjudication process with limited or no knowledge whatsoever of the case they will face and the likelihood of success. Under this bill, a party who carries out, who undertakes to carry out construction work or supply goods and services, the claimant, is entitled to make a progress payment claim at the end of each month. To ensure cash flows quickly, through the contracting chain, payment claims made under the bill from head contractors to principals would need to be paid within 20 business days of the claim or any lesser period that is stipulated in their construction contract. Payment claims by subcontractors to head contractors or between subcontractors will now need to be paid within 25 business days or any lesser period in the construction contract. Payment claims for certain residential related construction work will need to be paid by the date specified in the contract or 10 business days if there is no date specified. The party that receives a payment claim, the respondent, must issue a payment schedule within 15 business days of receiving the claim if it does not intend to pay the full amount claimed. The payment schedule must outline the amount to be paid and the reasons why payment is being withheld. 
Once presented with the payment schedule, the claimant can make an informed decision as to whether to apply for rapid adjudication to recover the full amount it considers it is owed. If the claimant elects to go to rapid adjudication, the respondent cannot raise reasons for withholding payment during that process that are not otherwise included in the payment schedule, such as set-offs or cross-claims. This means the respondent must treat payment sh schedules with the utmost of care. Alternatively, if the respondent does not give a payment schedule with, within the time required or pay the full amount claimed, the claimant may elect to either recover the full amount as a debt owed through the courts or apply for rapid adjudication. Before applying for rapid adjudication, the claimant must give the respondent notice of its intention to do so and a further opportunity to give a payment schedule within five business days. If no second chance payment schedule is received, the respondent is not entitled to provide a response or any submissions during the adjudication process. Process. The rapid adjudication process under Part 3 of this bill, as under the CCA and elsewhere, remains a pay now, argue later scheme designed to deliver an interim binding decision. So works can continue, but with about, without affecting the party's legal rights to go to court or use any other dispute resolution, resolution mechanism if unsatisfied with the decision. The adjudication process is to be carried out by an experienced independent registered adjudicator within a compressed time frame. Applications for adjudication are to be made are, made, are to be made by the claimant to a registered adjudicator specified in the construction contract, or if there is no adjudicator specified, the claimant is free to lodge the application with an authorised nominating authority of its choice. An authorised nominating authority is an individual or an organisation approved by the Building Commissioner to appoint adjudicators. There is currently a number of organisations performing a similar role under the CCA as appointers and elsewhere across Australia. It is expected that these organisations will apply to be authorised nominating authorities under the Bill. The adjudication process is designed to ensure claims are determined with speed, efficiency, minimum formality and cost, so, no, so money continues to flow through the contracting chain with minimal disruption. Once an adjudication application is made by the claimant, the adjudicator, specified in the contract or appointed by the authorising nominating authority, can make a decision to within as little as 10 business days. If the respondent does not provide or is not permitted to provide an adjudication response or within 10 business days after a valid adjudication response is provided. Clauses 35, 36 and 38 of the bill detail the powers and functions of the adjudicator. The process is not judicial and decisions are to be largely based upon the payment claim, payment schedule, adjudication application and response. But the adjudicator can request further submissions, call conferences or carry out inspections of the construction work. The adjudicator must decide the amount, if any, owed by the respondent to the claimant in respect to the claimant pain, claim, including the return or release of any performance security, the date on which the amount became or will become payable and any interest that is owed. The adjudicator must give brief reasons for the decision in the form of an adjudication determination. As the parties retain their rights to go to court or commence other dispute resolution processes, adjudication determinations under the bill are not a as a general rule, open to appeal or review. However, part three of the bill does introduce a limited right to seek a review of the adjudicator's determination by a senior adjudicator. This limited right of review will only be available for high value disputes, but will provide an aggrieved claimant or respondent with an alternative remedy to be exhausted outside of curial proceedings. This review mechanism is based on similar laws in Singapore and the recommendations of Mr Murray's review for the Commonwealth Government. This bill will also introduce measures to improve the overall fairness of contracting practices in the building and construction industry. Too often people find that rules are stacked against them right from the very outset. If a party gets squeezed via the withholding period of payment because they lack the same bargaining power as the other party, then some might invoke theories of free market economics to explain or even justify this situation. They may say, well, that's just the way it is and it's always going to be like that. We reject that notion in that an enhanced bargaining position in a free market is a licence to withhold money from those who are entitled to it. As a community, there are certain standards that we all can and should expect when it comes to contracting practices in the building and construction industry. This bill will introduce a range of mechanisms to improve the fairness of contracting practices across the industry. These include voiding unfair notice-based time bars, which operate to unfairly limit or restrict the contractor's entitlement to claim or receive payment under a construction contract, enacting a broader prohibition on pay when paid provisions, as well as requiring certain contracts to be put in written form and meet minimum standards to remove any uncertainty as to, whether, as to each party's rights and obligations. 
Another key pillar of the reform is the introduction in part four of the bill of a retention trust scheme that will apply down the supply chain. This is the first of its, this is the first of its kind in Australia that will protect subcontractors' retention money from being misappropriated or lost altogether in the event, uh, in the event of an insolvency. Often retention money may equal or even exceed a subcontractor's profit margin for a construction project. But right now, under the laws of this state, it is perfectly legal for a party holding or withholding retention money to use this money as they see fit. They can use it to prop up or increase their own cash flow or even apply it for purposes totally extraneous to the construction contract, such as buying a luxury car or financing an expensive holiday. The McGowan government believes this, that subcontract re retention money should be protected. It should no longer be treated within the industry as an interest-free loan that one can use for whatever purpose they choose. For that reason, the bill will impress retention money with trust status by force of law and require that it be ring-fenced in a dedicated trust account to separate it wholly and completely from the trustee's general pool of assets. Where a party fails to fulfil their obligations as a trustee of the retention money, beneficiary subcontractors will have access to existing general law remedies and, in some cases, a statutory right to suspend an ongoing construction work or the supply of related goods and services. Another important feature is Part 7 of the Bill, which provides the building industry regulators, the Building Commissioner and Building Services Board, with new powers to remove building contractors with a history of insolvency or not paying the court ordered or adjudication debts from the industry. It is the McGowan government's intention, by way of this bill, to impress upon the building and construction industry that the holding of a registration as a building contract in the state is a privilege and not a right. Those with a history of ripping off subcontractors or engaging in phoenixing activity by driving a construction business into the ground, then re-emerging from the ashes with a brand new business, will be placed squarely within the line of sights of regulators' new powers. For too long now, the regulators have had insufficient powers to adequately deal with the poor and unscrupulous conduct displayed by some contractors who use the corporate form to avoid their responsibilities. If you want to be a registered building contractor, then you need to play by the rules. Make sure you run your business properly, pay the sub subcontractors who work for you, or else you might rightly be required to show cause to the Building Services Board as to why you should be allowed to be a registered player in the industry. The Building Services Board new powers are extensive and include the ability to apply in exclusion where even shadow or straw directors are used. I conclude by emphasising that this bill will introduce significant and long overdue reforms to give confidence back to our subcontractors. These are reforms that will promote business growth and innovation and make this state a fairer and more desirable place for all to do business, safeguard and livelihood, the livelihood and wellbeing of Western Australians behind our construction businesses, complement measures the McGowan government delivered in its first term in office through the expanded use of the project bank accounts on government projects and enhancing the investigation powers of the state's small business commissioner. Pursuant to Standing Order 126, subclause 1, I advise that this bill is not a uniform legislation bill. It does not ratify or give effect to an intergovernmental or multilateral agreement to which the the government of this state is a party, nor does this bill, by reason of its subject matter, introduce a uniform scheme or uniform laws throughout the Commonwealth. I commend the bill to the House and table the explanatory memorandum. Members, that explanatory memorandum is tabled and debate stands adjourned. Members, I have three more messages. Uh, Honourable President, the Legislative Assembly acquaints the Legislative Council that it has agreed to the following resolution, that one, the terms contained in Legislative Council message number two for the establishment of the Joint Standing Committee on Audit be agreed to, and two, the Legislative Council be acquainted accordingly. Signed, Michelle Roberts. Speaker. Message number nine. Honourable President, the Legislative Assembly acquaints the Legislative Council that for the present Parliament, the Legislative Assembly has appointed the Member for Moore and the Member for Kalamunda as members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission, signed Michelle Roberts, Speaker. Uh, and the final message, message number 10, Honourable President, the Legislative Assembly acquaints the Legislative Council that for the present parliament, the Legislative Assembly has appointed the member for Murray Wellington and the member for Albany as members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Commissioner for Children and Young People, signed Michelle Roberts, MLA Speaker. Member, members, the House is adjourned.